Hello everyone, welcome to What If Deku Lost Everyone and Got Trained by Doctor Strange Part 1. Before we start please go support Zack Oblivion for writing that awesome fanfic. This is the translated version I made, there will be some wrong he or she calling here because it's translated so let me clear this Deku is a male in this story. Prologue. Stop me if you've heard this before, worlds will live, worlds will die. But imagine if all your fears, every bad decision you've made gave birth to a poorly formed nightmare world. A world that shouldn't exist and desperate to survive in the light of the true multiverse far above. These worlds are doomed to rot and die because they are wrong from the core. Welcome to the dark multiverse. The home of stories that should never be told. Where everything is nothing more than a big cosmic joke. Only on this side, nobody is laughing well, almost nobody. They say a person can go crazy on a bad day. But what happens if someone has a bad week or a bad month or a bad year? That is more than enough to break the spirit and will of the strongest hero and plunge him into utter despair. Chapter 1. Failure. Universe minus 94. It wasn't supposed to happen like this. Everything happened so fast. The war had begun. It suddenly exploded. As if it were a natural disaster. She has always been there. Waiting for their moment because in their minds they all know it will come. We can contain it but never eliminate it. We can pray but never abandon her. They thought they could do it. But they were wrong. He was much stronger than they thought. Nothing could stop him. It seemed like there were no limits. As if his hatred gave him more power. That man, Shigaraki Tamura. He no longer seemed to be human. Destroyed everything in its path. Nothing could stop him. Calling him a person would be too kind. It was. A monster. Lives were lost. Many lives. He knew what his goal was. And he had to get away from them. Don't love them, they were just looking for one for all. He distanced himself. He thought that if he kept them away they would be safe. But, he was only hurting them more. And himself too. In the end, he returned to them. But things were no longer as they were before. They had changed. He had changed. There was no more laughter, no more games. This was no longer a battle between heroes and villains. No, it was a fight for survival. All the prisons, which held the most dangerous criminals, turned to dust. The rule of not killing. It no longer worked. Prisons could not be built so quickly. They simply had no other choice. But it had to happen. It was inevitable. One way or another. In war there will always be deaths on both sides. That young hero remembers his first murder. How can we not forget it? Muscular. The damn madman was free and out of control. He had to do it, he was just a damn beast who only thought about killing and fighting. The hero still remembers it in detail. It was just a second. But in that second, his fist pierced his damn skull. He still remembers the sound of his skull breaking and the warm blood splashing across his face. It was and still is disgusting. Little by little his friends also began to accept this. That was the new rule. It was kill or be killed. Even other countries were involved. After America lost its number one, all for one's allies came out of hiding and began rampage, taking advantage of that moment of weakness. And the other countries followed them. It was just a matter of time. His mistake was thinking that the war would end in a single battle. How stupid they were. As if that were possible. Weeks and months passed, and before they knew it, a year had passed. And, in the second year. The worst came. The villains were too many. No matter how hard they struggled, things didn't seem to get any better. And, when they thought they had gotten a chance. Turns out it was just part of his plan. The hero blamed himself for not realizing. It was so damn obvious no one would go to war with such an obvious weakness right there on their face. Oh, they're so cute. Did you really think that, in all this time, I wouldn't have prevented this scenario? The most powerful villain asked with a cynical and mocking smile. The heroes could only stare in horror at the scene before them. If it makes you feel better. You never had a real chance all for one said, as he removed the remains of his mask. That only managed to further destroy those few hopes of winning. And then it happened. They. Their friends. Began to fall. The hero wants to forget it. He really wants to. He wants with all his might to forget those damned images. The scenes of their deaths are engraved in his damned head. Do you know what he felt? Do you have any idea what he felt at that moment? When he saw Kota burned to death. When Toga cut off Jiro's ears, then her tongue and cut her neck, leaving her to die slowly. When he saw Asui's eyes crying. But she smiled at him and said, everything will be okay Kiro, before Dobby crushed her skull and her brain, and parts of it fell on her face, while she was facing several villains. When Zero was shredded by a damn machine. When Tokoyami was dissolved in spinner's acid who then killed Ishido, but not without raping her first. When Kirishima, Shoji, Sado and Momo were turned into dust by Tamura's attack. When All Might. 
sacrificed himself so they could escape a trap. Midoriya Shounen said the former symbol of peace through a communicator. The blonde man was driving a truck, which was full of gasoline and other extremely volatile elements. Izuku, along with his few remaining friends, were leaving a base where Tamura was suspected to be hiding. They had gone to the place with a large group of heroes, only to find a completely abandoned factory and a small army of villains waiting for them when they left. Almost all of the heroes who accompanied them had died. Including Bakugo, who had his arms torn off, all witnessed by a helpless Izuku as he watched the Ashen haired boy being massacred. He died from blood loss, but not before whispering a few last words to his childhood friend. I'm sorry. Izuku didn't even have time to mourn the death of the Ashen haired boy when his sensei's voice reached his ears, thanks to a communicator he was wearing for emergencies. I'm sorry I can't say goodbye properly. I'd love to see you become the symbol I know you can be. I'm sorry I was such a bad teacher, but. I just want you to know. That I'm very proud of you said the blonde, saying goodbye to his student, with sadness and a face afflicted by what was about to happen to him. The green-haired man didn't know how to react when he saw a truck heading towards his position at high speed. Everything is fine, why? Because I'm here to take them to hell All Might shouted with all the determination in his being, while driving at full speed, running over all the villains in front of him. Until it crashed into a large villain, which caused a huge explosion. Sayonara. Midoriya Shounen. The former symbol of peace whispered, as the flames consumed him. The explosion was so powerful that it stunned the nearby villains, leaving them a clear path to escape. That day, Izuku lost another loved one. What was he supposed to do for them? He couldn't do anything anything. And. Now they were in this situation. The hero looks around him. And all he can see is destruction and death. A few meters away from him was the corpse of his friend Todoroki, he had a hole in the middle of his chest, with burns around it. And a few meters in front of him was the corpse of Dabi, Tuya Todoroki, his brother. With an ice spear piercing his heart. He had tried to save him when he discovered that they were brothers, but he quickly realized that it was too late. In the end, both brothers died by the other's hand. But the worst was yet to come, something that would mark a before and after for that young hero. Iizu dot dot Q. The green-haired boy heard the whisper of his voice. It sounded so weak, but just listening to it calmed him down. When he turned around, the first thing he saw was his face. Stained with blood, he could see that behind him there was a pile of rubble, from which an arm and some kind of syringes were sticking out. But by Toga. When he looks back at her, the horrible truth hits him. No. Her voice barely came out in small whispers. No. No, no 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 little by little the volume of his voice became louder as he got closer to her. When he finally had her in his arms, she collapsed limply onto him. The blood kept falling, dyeing that green suit a deep red color. Hold on Ichako, why you'll be okay, W will get through this, you'll get okay, I swear. He didn't even believe those words. He knew what was going to happen, but he didn't want to accept it. Aizu. Ku. The chestnut's hand moved tremblingly. As fragile as a dry autumn leaf. I barely managed to touch the cheek of the young man she loved. Aizu dot dot Q. I love. You. His hand fell limply, separating itself from the cheek of that young boy. The green-haired man's mind stopped for a second when he saw the last person he had left die. The most normal thing in this type of situation is that the person goes completely crazy. Let it explode in fury and hatred. But, these kinds of situations always have something in common. Before the storm comes the calm. And, before the explosion, Izuku's mind and will gave way. They froze completely thanks to the pain and shock of the situation. The situation. That Tamura did not waste. Izuku's vision darkened, and when he could see again he managed to see a certain black-haired girl in front of him, along with other people, who seemed to be being dragged by an infinite number of hands. When he finally came out of his shock, it was too late. Before he passed out, he could see a humanoid silhouette moving away from him. Which was surrounded by red and green rays. After that, the boy fell unconscious. Hours later, Izuku wakes up, only to be met with a horrifying scene. The Uraka lay dead in front of him. No. Said the green-haired man, while the memories of what happened came back to him. In a state of complete fear and despair, I attempt to activate one for all. Nothing. Absolutely nothing happened. He. He did it, he stole. The one for all. Said the boy with a broken voice, while tears came out of his eyes. That young man had lost everything, his family, his friends, the woman he loved. His daughter. And he had failed to stop Tamara. He. Had failed. Chapter 2. Wandering. War. The cause of the greatest massacres that humanity has ever seen. Destruction. That was the perfect word to define the state of today's society. 
Heroes were becoming fewer and fewer, it was now very common to see various groups of villains on the streets, either killing anyone who was unfortunate enough to cross their path, or simply stealing anything they wanted. The entire world had entered a new era of darkness. Governments around the world were completely destroyed, the top heroes of each country and continent were nothing more than corpses. If one were to look at the bigger picture of this world, one would say that it resembles a post-apocalyptic scenario from some movie. And the truth is. They are right. Humans had always been violent by nature, whether they like it or not, it was part of their very being. It is not for nothing that they are a race of conquerors, you only had to see what happened with the discovery of America to realize this. Morality. Honor. All those things they say make them human are nothing more than chains that they put on themselves, so as not to let out their dark and true nature. Which had come out again in these new times of crisis. The human race had returned to its origin. To the simple and beautiful. Chaos. We need reinforcements, I repeat, we need damn reinforcements as much as possible aggh. Thousands of bullet casings fell to the ground every second, creating a kind of metal carpet in front of that. Monster. Demon. No one knew for sure what it was. The tiny but sickly smile appeared on his deformed and grotesque face. His body was surrounded by black rays with a red glow, along with green rays. It only took one second, just one. So that thousands of soldiers would be reduced to dust. All for one man, no. A monster who had the strength of thousands. No, damn it we've lost half of our troops, we need to stop this somehow the death toll has already reached half a million did you hear? Half a million. For his part, Tamura Shigaraki advanced slowly and calmly in front of the entire army, which was trying to confront him. His efforts were in vain, no type of bullet could penetrate his skin, they only bounced off without causing any kind of damage. For each step he took, a part of the army exploded or disintegrated under his power. The white-haired man was clearly enjoying this, watching with a certain sickly ecstasy, as his attempts turned to dust, as his hopes disappeared, the fear, the anger, the frustration, the hatred of the people, it was a pleasure that simply could not be described with words. Some, in a state of complete terror and despair, threw their weapons to the ground and ran in terror, trying to save their pathetic lives. This was of no use to them, as they barely managed to take three steps before they were reduced to dust. The soldiers knew it, they knew it from the first moment. They never had a chance. If they didn't die yet it was because Tamura didn't want to end everything so quickly. He could take all the time in the world. After all. He held them in the palm of his hand. It only took a few minutes, just a few minutes for the white-haired boy to get bored. A huge army of a million soldiers was completely massacred. Some were turned into dust, having the privilege of having a quick and painless death. But others were not so lucky. The battlefield was completely devastated, in some parts you could see large stone stakes, on which were the corpses of the soldiers, some even seemed to still be alive, writhing as they awaited their imminent death. In another area, everything was submerged in large ice structures, the soldiers who received the attack were crushed by the cold ice, dying instantly, others were frozen, they would die of hypothermia shortly after. Another was on fire, and the stench of burning flesh from dead soldiers could still be smelled. And the other areas of the battlefield were not much different, carnivorous plants, magma, tornadoes, lightning, gravity increased to the point that the soldiers' bodies were crushed by their own weight, each area of the place was devastated by a different force. That was the advantage of having hundreds or even thousands of quirks, there was a lot of variety. And in the middle of all that massacre, there was the person responsible. The white-haired man with a macabre smile on his blood-stained face, but it wasn't his blood. This guy, Tamara. All for one. To tell the truth, he didn't even know who he was. That thing had been born from the fusion of the two most hated beings. They know what I am, they pretend not to know, but they know perfectly well. I am no different from any of you. The only difference is that I stop limiting myself. Honor, laws, morality. None of that binds me anymore. You all fear revealing your true nature, your cruelty. Try to run away, it won't help you. They say I'm a demon. A monster, but. Aren't we all? The white-haired man managed to see something moving a few meters away, between a small mountain of rubble, with a smile he approached slowly, while he continued talking, they're trying to stop me. But they know it's something that can't be stopped. Tell me. What's the point of fighting against the inevitable? Life is not a story where good will always win. Where evil will lose just because. You don't understand, what's the point of continuing to fight if in the end evil always returns. In dark times. Pillars rise to give people hope, but they must always remember one thing. That darkness has always been and will always be present. When the sun dies, darkness will reclaim what light is taken from it. Because the darkness never left and it never will. I no longer have limits. 
Tamura arrived and saw that what was crawling on the ground was a dying soldier, the man had lost the lower half of his legs, leaving a trail of blood in some of his guts on the ground. With a cruel smile, the white-haired man grabbed the dying man by the head, forcing him to look him in the eyes I no longer have anything that limits me. Nothing that binds me the poor man looked horrified at that human-shaped monster, there are no more strings. With that last phrase, Tamura applied a little force on the man's head, causing it to explode like a water balloon, the man didn't even have time to scream, either because he didn't have the strength to do so, or because he was too fast. The soldier's blood, along with remnants of his brain, splattered on Tamura's face, who was unfazed by this. Tamura's gaze fell upon the battlefield and the thousands of corpses of the soldiers who tried to stop him. Without wires anymore. I can walk. And even run. And even dance. Opening his eyes, the green-haired boy was greeted by the bright rays of the sun all over his face. The strong light forced him to close his eyelids again. Once he got used to the light, he was able to better observe the place he was in. He could see that he was lying on the sand, while in front of him was a beautiful sea of crystal clear water, and in the distance he could see a few mountains, all bathed by the beautiful rays of the sun. Seeing the place he was in, Izuku could only ask himself one question. Am I dead? That question came out in the form of a brief whisper from the boy's lips. It took him a few seconds to get over his little shock, as he did so he settled down on the warm sand, while looking out at the sea. Damn it, why is it that the only thing there is in this filthy afterlife are rocks and sea? On television they keep talking about heaven, paradise and all that, and in the end look what it is. The freckled boy complained while looking at the place although, it seems quite familiar to me. I hope. I can meet them. At that, he heard footsteps approaching behind him, he instantly stood up and turned around, expecting to meet one of his friends, his mother or... Yuraka. Acha. Ko. The young hero's voice died in his mouth, as he saw that the person in front of him was none of those he had expected. Instead of one of his friends, he found himself. In front of him was a version of himself, only as a child, sitting on the sand staring at the sea. The boy, noticing the gaze of his older version, turned to look at him with a neutral and expressionless face, nothing that one would expect from a child. I see, so I'm in my mind. I guess this is what it looks like without one for all the older freckled man said seriously, only to refocus his gaze on his younger version, why am I here? The little green-haired boy just looked at him out of the corner of his eye, then let out a small sigh. But God. I'm trying to admire the peaceful scenery, and I have to put up with some would-be hero making a pathetic ruckus the boy complained in annoyance. Izuku widened his eyes at his younger self's words, but instantly grew annoyed. He'd been through too much shit for some brat to come and screw him over. What do you mean by pitiful commotion? The older green-haired man asked, indignant and annoyed. I hope I can meet them. If saying those things isn't regrettable, then what is? Being stupid. He asked, mockingly imitating the voice of his older self. But, what are you talking about? You can't blame me for wanting to meet them after all the disaster we had to endure I'm already tired, I just want to rest and see them again, the older freckled man shouted furiously, while looking at his younger version, who still kept his neutral face. The FFF wanting to rest? Is that what you say to convince yourself? The boy snorted with a look that clearly said he didn't believe anything his older version said, I can clearly see the word revenge written on your face, in capital letters. In fact, I don't know how you can even see with those eyes of yours so full of resentment. Izuku clenched his fists tightly, clearly annoyed by his younger self's words. But, he saw how the boy settled down on the sand and stared at him. Stop lying about your life and sit down. Tell me what's tormenting you said the freckled boy seriously. The older green-haired man let out a sigh. Seeing that he had nothing to lose, he sat down on the warm sand next to his younger self. The minutes passed, Izuku told the boy everything, from the beginning of the war to Yuraka's death, and that due to his carelessness, he lost one for all at the hands of Tamura. So. The war broke out, you lost mom, your friends, your teacher, the woman you love, not to mention that you failed to stop the person responsible for everything, said the child upon hearing everything that his older version had told him, wow, you really have bad luck, exclaimed the little one with a cynical smile, all the more reason you can't rest. You have to go back and tear that bastard to pieces not only because it's the best for everyone, but also because this has become personal. Izuku felt a vein stand out on his forehead due to the great fury he felt at that moment. Are you aware of what you're telling me? You say you want me to go and get revenge. Oh come on don't be a saint with me, you have every right to want revenge, or are you going to tell me that after everything he did to you, you don't want to smash his head in? The boy asked, looking at the older freckled boy with a mocking smile. This seemed to exhaust Izuku's patience and he stood up. Oh my god are you done talking? The older freckled boy asked angrily, surprising the boy a little do you think I'm happy about all the shit that happened? Do you really think I'm not angry? 
no matter how hard I try, I can't stop feeling this way I've never wished anyone bad in my life, not even when Katsuki told me to commit suicide, but now. Every time I remember what happened, I can't help but think of ways to rip his head off I hate him with all my strength I swear, if I had the chance, I would kill him without hesitation. Izuku screamed at the top of his lungs, to the point where his throat started to hurt. When he stopped screaming, he started to gasp, trying to catch his breath. All while his younger self stared at him, without any change in his expression. Ha. Ah, it's normal for you to feel that way. The hate. The desire for revenge. I took everything from you, your friends, your family. Even your daughter or son. Don't torment yourself about it, any person with more than two functional neurons would be the same or worse than you, that's how we humans are said the boy, with an empty smile. But. It shouldn't be like this Izuku growled, his gaze downcast. Well. Whether you like it or not, that's the reality, one can't control their emotions to decide what to feel or not, if you hate someone, you hate them, and that's it, the boy turned around and looked him in the eyes, don't try to act like some kind of saint who loves everyone no matter what. That's nothing more than a stupid lie to make people feel good about themselves. Izuku looked down, his eyes empty, devoid of any kind of shine. And? Now what do we do? He asked his younger version. I won't deny that things look bad. Okay, very bad. But I don't think you want to die yet, not without taking that madman to hell with us, the boy said with a smile, receiving a small nod from the older green-haired boy, the best thing would be for you to go out and find a way to kill that son of a hitch. There must be something that can be done, if we couldn't, then there must be someone else. The world is very big, and it is full of quirks and powerful subjects. Both green-haired boys were sitting on the seashore, while well, little by little the tide was rising, little by little the water was beginning to cover their legs, reaching the waste area. I'm scared. Izuku said, while his gaze was fixed on the horizon. Me too. The little boy answered with a sad smile, but we can't stop. Not now, when all this is over. We can finally rest. They both felt the water slowly rising, but neither did anything, even though they were looking at the horizon. Without saying a word, both green-haired men closed their eyes, while they were swallowed by the sea. Slowly the green-haired boy opened his eyes, after that strange dream he had. At least it was a dream and not. The usual nightmares he said, as he stood up and looked at the place where he was. He was inside a completely dirty and messy room, full of debris everywhere, the boy was lying on the dirty and battered remains of an old armchair, while at his side, he had an old radio, which barely seemed to work. Izuku let out a sigh as he saw that everything remained the same. Sometimes he wished that all of this was nothing more than a horrible nightmare. That one day he would wake up in his dorm room with all of his friends ready for another day at UA. But no. This was the reality. Memories of what happened after his defeat against Tamura, which happened at least three weeks ago, came to his tired mind. After learning of the defeat, he did what anyone with an ounce of brain would do. He let out his frustration by screaming and crying. When he finished venting, he had to find a temporary shelter. Luckily, there were many abandoned houses and buildings, some were in better condition than others, but they would do. Since he lost his quirk things only got a lot worse, now he had no way to defend himself from the villains, hand-to-hand -hand combat was of little or no use to him against guys who could destroy houses with a casual blow. In those moments he realized that facing villains without a quirk was impossible. That being a hero without a quirk was impossible. He simply had nothing to confront them with, he was not a super prodigy in martial arts, he was not a genius with technology, the only thing he had was the determination to face them, but that was of no use to him. I needed power. That was an indisputable truth. He had to look for food everywhere, from garbage dumps to eating rats and other things he found on the street. The supermarkets were completely emptied as soon as the war began. Not to mention, he had to take care of not only the villains, but the new gangs that had formed. Several groups of civilians had banded together to survive, the problem was that they were capable of attacking anyone they found to steal their resources. Because of this, he had to fend for himself. During all this time, he was wondering why Tamura didn't kill him, he was without one for all, unconscious, completely defenseless. His answer came a few days later. While he was looking for something to eat in some garbage containers, he saw some people who were passing by see him. The first thing he did was to be on guard in case he had to fight, but what he heard made him freeze. Is that boy a hero? A man asked. And they said they would save us. Just look at it, the heroes disappeared. And there is no hope. After that, those people left. They may have been few words, but they were enough to give him the answer he was looking for. That damn Tamura had left him alive so that he could live with his own failure, and not only that, but also to show people that there was no hope anymore. It was very ironic, he always wanted people to smile and feel safe when they saw him, but now it was the complete opposite. His very presence showed people that everything was wrong. 
The Mura had turned him into everything he had always dreamed of, now he was just the shadow of his former self, a wonder. Azuku ran through the streets of the devastated city, the cloudy sky only making the panorama even sadder. The boy saw all this and couldn't help but compare it to the view worthy of a post-apocalyptic world. On his back he had an old, worn backpack where he kept all his provisions, from half-stale food to some torn sheets. In a hostile environment, he had to be constantly on the move, he couldn't stay in one place for long due to the constant threat of villains and gangs. The boy ran quickly through the streets, looking for anything that could be of use to him, be it food, clothing, weapons or even a possible shelter. However, he was forced out of his thoughts when he heard the loud and characteristic sound of the turbines of a ship. Looking up, he saw with surprise that a plane was landing in the middle of the city, where there was a crater large enough for the vehicle to enter. From some rubble, I managed to see how the plane doors opened and several heavily armed soldiers came out. Shit. The boy whispered, he didn't know if they were friends or enemies, but he didn't want to be close to find out and risk a very probable death. Izuku began to back away little by little, however. Stop, identify yourself immediately shouted a soldier, who had managed to detect him and was now pointing his weapon at him. Instantly, the green-haired man stood completely still, raising his hands in surrender. He didn't know what to do, one wrong move and he was finished. But, at that moment, what he could define as a miracle occurred. Soldier, put down your weapon. A very well-known female voice reached Izuku's ears, who opened his eyes wide. He slowly turned around to meet the owner of the voice. Hello Izuku, I'm glad to see you're still alive, said a young blonde woman with blue eyes, who was wearing glasses, not to mention that she was wearing some kind of military uniform, as well as a metal shield on one of her arms. Seeing that woman, Izuku only managed to mutter something in his state of shock. Melissa. Chapter 3. The Story of the Dead. In the middle of that ruined city, one could see a scene that was, to say the least, peculiar. Izuku stared in disbelief at the blonde with glasses in front of him. He hadn't seen his friend Melissa for months, when the Eye Island incident happened, he didn't expect to see her here at all, it was something that had taken him totally by surprise, but he was also glad to know that at least one of his friends was still alive, after all the disaster that Afo and Tamura had started. Just by looking at the suit and shield the blonde was wearing, he already had an idea of what had happened to her during these last few months of darkness. He didn't blame her, it was necessary to adapt, to get out of her comfort zone, to survive. The green-haired boy still remained silent, due to the shock that this situation caused him, silence seemed to have taken over the place, while the gazes of both, the blonde and the freckled one, remained glued to each other. That was how it went on for a few seconds, which seemed like an eternity. Letting out a small sigh of relief, Izuku lowered his hands, feeling more relaxed at finding himself with an ally, and more importantly, an old friend. I'm glad to see you, Melissa Izuku said, while a small smile appeared on his lips, feeling happy to be, again, in front of the American blonde. I'm glad to see you too, Izuku the blonde exclaimed, returning the greeting with a smile, reflecting her happiness, please excuse the behavior of my men, we have to be alert to anything she apologized, without losing her smile, somewhat embarrassed, while scratching the back of her neck. He don't worry, it's understandable, given the situation said the freckled man, letting out a somewhat bitter laugh, looking at the destroyed and desolate panorama, something that was noticed by Melissa, putting on a sad face. Things are terrible were the only words that came out of the mouth of the blonde with glasses. Yes. The green-haired man gave a small sigh, before turning his gaze to the American girl, it's not that your appearance bothers me, but, what are you doing here? I didn't know that reinforcements from the United States would arrive the green-haired man asked curiously. At these words, Melissa looked at the boy with a face that reflected surprise. Izuku. Don't you know? The blonde asked, approaching her friend Japan was declared a forbidden zone, a few days ago a message was sent, all the governments. What's left of the governments, sent their armies to collect the survivors of Japan. They are evacuating the entire country she explained with sadness and regret. The green-haired man's eyes widened at this news. He knew that the damage that Tamura and Afo had caused was enormous, but he didn't think it would lead to this. Japan was declared as the central base of Afo and Tamura, in itself it is an extremely risky operation to step on this ground, that is why several troops were sent to evacuate the few survivors and to see if there were heroes who could help, no. I thought I would find you, I thought. But you were dead Melissa said sadly, already in front of the boy and seeing the state he was in, she could not avoid the enormous sadness she felt seeing him in that state. His suit was torn to pieces, totally dirty, he had mud and blood stains everywhere, and the worst thing was his look, that smile that the boy had when they met, was no longer there, in its place, there was a look full of sadness and regret. This has definitely affected you a lot, Izuku the blonde thought sadly, seeing her friend state. For his part, the freckled boy still hadn't gotten over his little shock upon hearing the blonde's words. Are you going to? 
leave Japan. Izuku spoke in complete shock. This couldn't be happening, they were leaving practically the entire country in the hands of those two psychopaths, who knows what those two would do now with all the country's resources at their disposal. Izuku, I know it's hard for you, it is for everyone. But, for now, we can't do anything for this country, the best we can do is evacuate the few survivors left, so at least they can return home when. When we win this Melissa said with regret in her voice, but without erasing the seriousness. Izuku just lowered his head, while clenching his fists tightly. He felt completely helpless, they had practically lost in every aspect, to the point where they were forced to escape from the entire country, so as not to be killed. The boy could only think of all the lives that had been ruined because of those two monsters. Hundreds of thousands dead, entire families destroyed, lives ruined, and the list goes on and on. Izuku felt like a fool for thinking there was something good inside Tamara. I was completely wrong, that guy. He was a monster. Izuku. Melissa spoke with a soft voice, knowing that it was not an easy decision for the boy to leave his country, she put a hand on his shoulder, in a sign of support, making him raise his head then look her in the eyes we must go, it is our only alternative, they have already taken the whole country. They will not survive if they stay. Izuku knew it, he knew the blonde was right. The whole world was plunged into chaos, but Japan was the one most affected by this new dark era. If they wanted to defeat these two monsters, they had to leave. To fight again another day. He looked up, making his eyes meet Melissa's blue eyes, he was about to say something, when suddenly. They are attacking you as one of the soldiers shouted, agitated. And it was no wonder, as several gnomus were seen coming out of an alley several meters away from them. These monsters roared ferociously upon seeing them, beginning to run towards them with the sole purpose of eliminating them. Shit. Melissa muttered upon seeing this, they had barely landed a few minutes ago, and they had already been discovered, without a doubt that was not a good sign everyone back off, we're retreating, the blonde shouted to her soldiers. The gnomus roared like the mindless beasts they were, running ferociously towards them, the soldiers wasted no time, and began firing at point-blank range at the beasts, specifically aiming for their brains, knowing that this was their weak point. Some of the shots did hit their target, causing damage to the exposed organ, however, this would not kill them, not even close, it would only give them enough time to get on the plane and take off to leave the area. Prepare for takeoff the shield girl ordered those in charge of the supplies, through a communicator she had in her ear. She also took out a firearm, starting to shoot at the eyes of the gnomus, barely managing to hit one or two, which would give them some time while they regenerated everyone to the ship, now he ordered them seriously, while he watched as those monsters that were once human, regenerated from the little damage they had managed to cause them. The gnomus regrouped, beginning to attack using their quirks, some began to shoot blasts of fire from their mouths, while others launched lightning or energy beams. Thanks to all the power and resources that the villains had acquired, they had managed to create more powerful and varied gnomus, not as much as the high games, but several gnomus that could use a wider variety of quirks, no longer just regeneration or super strength. The soldiers had to retreat in the face of multiple attacks from the gnomus, some managed to dodge said attacks without receiving damage, however, others were not so lucky. Ah my leg a soldier screamed in pain as he fell to the ground, because his leg had been hit by a flame, leaving him with very serious burns. Izuku saw this and tried to go to his rescue, moving away from Melissa. Izuku, come back here I shouted scared and worried. However, the green-haired man ignored it, he just ran towards the wounded soldier, managing to narrowly avoid several of the gnomus's attacks. He was about to reach the soldier, when suddenly, a huge burst of fire hit the poor man, who could only let out enormous and horrible screams of pain, feeling his being engulfed by the scorching flames, his skin melting and his flesh cooking. The poor soldier could not bear so much pain, so, knowing that it was his end, he took his gun, pointed it at his own head. And fired. Bam. The man's body fell dead to the ground, still being slowly consumed by the flames. All this happened just a meter away from Izuku, who watched everything with an expression of complete horror, despite having seen an enormous amount of things since this whole war thing began, one never quite got used to this kind of things. The boy was brought out of his thoughts when he felt a hand grab his arm firmly and tightly, turning around instantly, meeting the serious face of the American blonde. Izuku, we are outnumbered, we must leave immediately, she shouted at him, upset, clearly upset by the freckled man's action of going after the now dead soldier. The boy couldn't say anything when his friend began to drag him to the plane, while the soldiers retreated more and more, due to the large number of attacks launched by the gnomus, several had to take out some kind of technological device, which deployed an energy shield, using it to prevent the plane from suffering damage. Everyone on the plane, now it was the strong and powerful shout of Melissa, who was already entering the plane with Izuku. The soldiers did not hesitate for a second and entered the aircraft, which immediately began to take off. 
Even while in the air, the soldiers had to keep firing at the Nomus, making sure that they did not manage to hit the aircraft. Get us out of here the blonde shouted at the driver, who obeyed without hesitation. Within a few seconds, the plane was already in the air, managing to rise a couple of meters, before gradually gaining speed. Although this was somewhat difficult, because he had to be very careful with the attacks launched by the Nomus. Eventually, they managed to take flight and begin to escape the area, quickly moving away from Afo and Tamura's monsters. Melissa could only let out a small sigh at this, being grateful that they had been able to escape from those terrible monsters, but she knew that not everything was so easy, so she turned her gaze to the team general, after her. Soldier, report to the team the American blonde ordered with utmost seriousness. The soldier removed his helmet, revealing an adult man with black hair and eyes, a small beard and some scars on his face and neck. We have three wounded soldiers, luckily they are superficial wounds, some first degree burns, second degree at most, but nothing more than that. However, we lost almost half of our men the black-haired man informed him in a serious tone, but the sorrow was noticeable in his voice. Melissa just lowered her head in sadness at the information given by the soldier, keeping a few seconds of silence in honor of the fallen, before speaking again. I understand. Thank you for the report, rest, soldier the blonde said seriously, before turning around and starting to walk away from the man. However, he could notice how the blue-eyed girl was clenching her fists tightly, a clear sign that she was upset about the lives that were lost. Melissa was very frustrated, they had only been on the ground for 5 or 10 minutes, and they had lost almost half of their squadron, and that was despite the fact that they had gone with only 15 soldiers, they hadn't brought any more since they didn't fit on the ship, and the objective was to go unnoticed, so as not to be detected by the Nomus or villains in the area. Which in the end didn't turn out the way they thought. For his part, Izuku was just sitting in one of the airplane seats, his head down as he clenched his fists helplessly. Once again, he hadn't been able to save the person, all he could do was watch. He hated this, he hated not being able to do anything, he hated feeling so useless. If he had won for all, he would have arrived in time, and the poor man would be alive. But he knew this wasn't the first time he felt this way, he'd experienced it before. Every time one of his friends had passed away, he felt it. If only. I had been stronger. Things would be different. The green-haired man came out of his thoughts when he heard footsteps approaching him, he didn't even have to look up, knowing who the person was. Melissa sat next to him, looking at him with a mix of seriousness and support. So. Do you want to talk? She asked, not knowing how to start a conversation after the encounter they had with the Nomus. I'm not in the mood, sorry Melissa the boy apologized, raising his gaze slightly to look the blonde in the eyes. No problem, I understand she replied, while placing her hand on his back in support. Izuku appreciated this gesture from his friend, giving her a small smile of gratitude, which she reciprocated. So. Where are we going now? The boy asked, sitting up in his seat, looking at his American friend. To a shelter. The blonde said seriously since this whole disaster began, different secret shelters have been established around the world, with the aim of housing as many civilians and heroes as possible. There are several in each country in the world, but, due to the seriousness of the current situation, all the shelters near us are full she explained, while looking seriously at the boy. Izuku was surprised by this information, it made sense that shelters had been formed for people, at the time, the hero academies in Japan had been converted to house as many people as possible, unfortunately, this did not end well. So, which shelter are we going to? Asked a freckled man, since if the ones closest to Japan were full, then they would have to go to another one that had enough space and resources. We'll go to a shelter that opened its doors recently. Apparently, the owner of the place is a hermit, who remained hidden from the outside world until now the blonde told him. I understand. Izuku murmured, somewhat curious as to how the owner of this shelter would be, and where is it, exactly. He's in Kathmandu, Nepal, in other words, in India was the blonde simple and direct response, not wasting time and getting straight to the point. The freckled boy's eyes widened greatly upon hearing the blonde's response, he was surprised that the shelter was so far away, but he also knew that in this type of situation, criticism was not the time to get picky, it was already a miracle that there was room for them in one of the shelters. I understand. Said the boy, letting out a small sigh and. How long will it take us to get there? He asked, while leaning against the wall. Well, in a normal plane it would take about 14 hours, approximately, but this plane was modified to be much faster, so it will take less time, I suppose about 7 or 8 hours Melissa explained calmly, thinking a little. Then we have a moment to rest. The freckled man commented, while stretching his arms over his head, to the point where his joints could be heard creaking. True, the best thing would be to replenish our energy said the American blonde, leaning against the wall, just like her green-haired friend. 
In this way, both young people remained silent for a few seconds, a silence that quickly became uncomfortable for both of them, something that one could easily notice just by looking at their faces. Izuku had a face that clearly reflected how uncomfortable he felt, wanting to get out of that situation, he decided to start a conversation with his friend, taking advantage of the fact that they would be there for a long time. So. You joined the army, should I start calling you, shield soldier? The freckled man asked in a somewhat joking tone. For her part, the blonde knew what her friend was doing, not being able to help but have a somewhat amused smile appear on her face, at his attempt to break the awkward silence, deciding to play along. More like Captain, since I lead several squadrons said the blonde, with some pride in her own abilities. Well congratulations, Captain said the freckled man with a smile, it's impressive that you have reached that position. Thank you. The American girl's smile faltered a little, changing to an expression that reflected sadness I had to do a lot to survive up to this point, it wasn't easy. She said regretfully, while firmly holding the metal shield she carried on her arm. Izuku looked sadly at his friend, resting his hand on her left shoulder in support. He knew perfectly well how she felt, having to make difficult decisions just to survive in these new dark times. And. Your father. The boy had in mind the possibility that his friend's father was dead, but he couldn't avoid his curiosity, and he also wanted her to confirm his doubts. To her regret, her doubts were answered, not directly through words, she knew it when she saw how her friend's face changed to a sad one, in addition to clenching her fists tightly, as a sign that it hurt her just to remember that event. This quickly caused the freckled boy to get nervous, noticing how he had touched a sensitive spot, mentally cursing himself for being so insensitive. I am sorry, I just w wanted to know if he was okay, I I didn't want to. The freckled man said nervously, trying to apologize to the American blonde. However, she raised her hand, indicating that she wanted him to stop talking, which he understood and obeyed without hesitation. You don't have to apologize, Izuku, I appreciate that you care Melissa said, while a small smile appeared on her lips. Those horrible memories passed through the blonde's mind. She and her father in the laboratory, taking refuge, only to be attacked by a large number of villains, there were some heroes who tried to defend them, but it was all in vain. Their attack caused great destruction to the building, causing it to begin to fall apart. She had managed to escape in time. But her father hadn't. Because of the villains, they hadn't even managed to find the corpse. After that, he had to join the army to survive. Melissa just shook her head a little, deciding to push those bad memories out of her head, turning her attention back to her green-haired friend. Well. Leaving that aside Izuku would say, still somewhat nervous for having asked about a sensitive subject of his friend, it seems that you have been doing well in the army. Melissa couldn't help but let out a small laugh at seeing her friend's nerves, she still remembered when they met on I Island, although now he seemed more confident in himself, he still had a bit of those nerves that characterized him. You haven't changed, he the blonde commented with an amused smile. This time, the boy blushed a little at the blonde's words. The I, I think so said the blushing and embarrassed boy, trying to think of a topic of conversation that would get him out of that situation, until he managed to find one by the way, I saw those shields that the soldiers used before, out of curiosity, did you make them? He asked curiously. Yes, in fact I was the one who made them, since I joined the army, I not only serve as a soldier, but I also help in the technology section, making some support devices for the soldiers, such as plasma shields, in addition, I was one of the people who modified this plane to make it faster, explained the American blonde, with some pride in her work. It's amazing, Melissa said the freckled boy with a smile, amazed by what his friend had done to support in that war against the villains, I'm sure your father would be very proud of you. This time, it was Melissa's turn to blush slightly at the freckled boy's words, giving him a happy smile in response. He thanks Izuku, I appreciate it, she thanked him with a happy smile, before standing up and stretching her arms well, it will take us a few hours to get there, it would be best if we rest, there are some sleeping bags, I'll get you one, you look exhausted was what the blonde said, as she went to look for the sleeping bags. And, just as the girl said, the green-haired boy looked exhausted, something that was reflected in his more than clear dark circles and exhausted expression. The boy was tired, that was a fact, for several days he had not managed to sleep well, either because he had to be alert not to be found or attacked by villains or gnomus, or because of the fact of sleeping on top of rubble, being in the best of cases, on old and dirty mattresses, not to mention the cold, and the fact that he had not managed to bathe in a long time. Something that was noticeable by his clothes full of mud and grime, in addition to the smell he emanated. Well, here you go Melissa told him, handing him a grey sleeping bag, returning after a few minutes of searching for said object I'm sorry, but there are no rooms or anything like that, this is a plane, not a hotel the blonde commented jokingly. This comment managed to elicit a small laugh from the boy. Thank you, Melissa he thanked her with a smile, while taking the sleeping bag. 
No problem, rest, I'll get some sleep too, just like the others said the blonde, while pointing at how the soldiers had taken their respective sleeping bags and were resting, sleeping on the floor of the plane, you have to be well rested if you're going to fight in the war. Those were the words Melissa said, before lying down on the ground, getting into her sleeping bag and settling in to rest, an action that was imitated by Izuku, lying down next to her. Rest up Melissa, and. Thanks for finding me the boy thanked her, with a smile on his face as he glanced at his friend. He was very happy that they had both met again, he was very glad to be in the company of a friend again, it was something he urgently needed, after the tragic deaths of his friends from class 1A. So, meeting a friend, or in this case, a female friend, alive again was something that made him very happy. Without saying anything else, the boy settled into his sleeping bag, closing his eyes as he let out a sigh of happiness, feeling how comfortable the fabric of the bag was, compared to the hard cold rocks and or rubble he usually slept on. It only took a few seconds for the freckled boy to fall into Morpheus's arms, closing his eyes and falling into a deep sleep. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. The very familiar female voice rang in the green-haired man's ears, he slowly began to open his eyes, feeling the light hitting them and forcing him to close them again. It took him only a few seconds to adjust to it, but when he finally managed to open them, he saw him, or rather, he saw her. There she was, smiling sweetly at him like she usually did. Izuku's gaze perfectly reflected how confused he was, panting slightly, looking into her brown eyes. Biraka was there, in front of him, Viva. He realized that the two of them were on a bed, his mind was going a thousand miles an hour, trying to figure out what was happening. Is something wrong? You look very tense the brunette asked softly, looking lovingly at the boy. The freckled boy sat up in bed, staring at the brown-haired girl with wide eyes, looking like he was watching the birth of the most beautiful of miracles. You're here. Were the weak and soft words that the young man managed to say, after having gathered all his mental strength to speak, without taking his eyes full of surprise off the sweet and loving face of his beloved. That's right. Yuraka said in such a soft way that it sounded like a barely audible whisper, but despite this, Izuku was able to hear her perfectly. Why you're staying? The green-haired man asked fearfully, looking nervously at the girl who had stolen his heart. He didn't realize it, but his hand moved on its own, taking the brunette's hand, feeling how soft her skin was, and squeezing it lightly, as if he were afraid that, by letting go, it would disappear. You know I don't. Was the soft whisper the girl gave him in response. Achako. I am really sorry. Izuku's voice began to break with each word he said, he felt his lips tremble, and his eyes begin to water, a sign that tears were beginning to form, due to the enormous sadness he felt just seeing the brunette. I know. The brunette said in a whisper, as she got closer to the green-haired man. This time, I, I will be stronger, I swear, I will have more power, t that way I can protect you. The green-haired man's words showed a mix of seriousness and sadness, without taking his gaze off Uraraka's face for a second, seeming not to even blink. And are you serious? I asked him, whispering the question in the boy's ear, with an almost mocking tone. W why are you making fun of me? He asked in surprise, feeling a horrible shiver run through his entire body, while the hairs on his neck stood up. The expression on Yuraka's face suddenly changed to a more serious and gloomy one, which did nothing to calm Izuku's growing nerves. It's late. That whisper was said in a cold and gloomy tone, sounding like the voice of a dead person, which only caused great fear to the freckled boy. Yuraka looked down at her abdomen, an action that Izuku imitated. Upon performing this action, the green-haired boy's eyes widened as he watched in horror, as the girl's abdomen had a huge wound, from which blood was coming out in large quantities. No, Echako he screamed in horror, feeling his face turn pale from the enormous fear he felt. Immediately, he placed his hands around the wound, beginning to apply pressure, in a desperate attempt to stop the bleeding. It's useless. Yuraka murmured, her voice empty and increasingly weak. No, 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 was the only thing the boy could say, to the point where his hands were shaking, feeling how they were stained with the brunette's blood no. But that scream full of desperation, fear and panic, Izuku woke up. The boy was panting heavily, feeling his heart beating rapidly. He managed to calm down a bit, noticing how he was on the plane, he looked down, noticing the sleeping bag and Melissa beside him. And speaking of the blonde, she began to wake up slowly, due to the noise and the way the boy shook when he woke up. Izuku, what's wrong? The blonde asked, rubbing her eyes as she woke up. However, Melissa did not receive a response from Izuku, which only left her confused. She was about to speak again when she noticed tears coming out of her friend's eyes, understanding that he had had a nightmare, and she completely doubted that it was a normal one. Izuku. The girl whispered with concern for her friend's condition. She had seen this several times before, and she recognized it instantly. Her friend was having nightmares because of the trauma he must have suffered in this war. 
She had seen similar cases in several of her soldiers, she knew what this could do to people, and she wasn't going to let the freckled boy go through the same thing. Without saying anything, Melissa sat down, moving closer to the freckled boy. She took advantage of the small trance he was in to wrap her arms around his body, giving him a warm and gentle hug. The green-haired boy snapped out of his trance when he felt a pair of arms hugging him, glancing sideways and noticing how his friend was responsible for said action. Them Melissa. The freckled boy said in surprise, his voice trembling, seeming like it was going to break into pieces at any moment. Calm down Izuku, I know what's happening to you. You must have suffered a lot. He murmured to his friend, using the softest and most comforting tone he could, trying to make him feel at least a little more relaxed you must have been through a lot. Let it out, cry all you need. The freckled boy was surprised to hear his American friend's words, he tried to resist, but he couldn't. In the end, she ended up reciprocating that hug, resting her head on Melissa's shoulder, and. She broke down. Izuku burst into tears, he cried his eyes out on the girl's shoulder, he made sure not to cry out loud, so that the soldiers wouldn't wake up, but even so, he made sure to vent completely on the girl's shoulder. The green-haired man was venting about everything that had happened, about every friend and quiet person he had lost, without being able to do anything. Melissa just hugged her friend, letting him vent, she knew he had been through bad times, everyone had, everyone had lost someone in this war, and she was more than sure that the freckled boy had not been the exception. After a few minutes, the boy stopped crying, his cries now becoming small whimpers on his friend's shoulder. Are you feeling better? The blonde asked softly. I lost Melissa. He defeated me. Tamura defeated me. He killed them all and. He stole my quirk. The freckled boy said in a soft whisper, feeling how there were still tears coming out of his eyes. Melissa would be lying if she said she wasn't expecting something like that, she deduced that the moment they found him. He was alone and didn't use his quirk against the gnomus that attacked them, those were more than obvious clues, but now her suspicions had been confirmed, and that only made her feel worse for the boy. Calm down, Izuku. We will defeat him, I swear, in the end, everything will be fine Melissa said, gently and comfortingly stroking Izuku's hair. The girl's actions seemed to have an effect on the green-haired boy, his breathing returned to normal, his sobs dried up, a sign that he had managed to calm down. Thank you Melissa. Thank you very much said the freckled boy, while keeping a firm hug around his friend. I was really happy and grateful to her for finding him, otherwise I was afraid he might not have survived. They both hugged each other for several minutes, allowing the freckled boy to calm down completely. That was until the blonde received a call through her earpiece, separating from the hug. I'm sorry, I have to take care of this the blonde apologized, separating from the hug, before standing up and answering her communicator what's wrong. She asked seriously. Izuku just looked curiously at his friend, noticing how her eyes had widened a little, whatever the news was, it had to be important. Understood, thanks for letting me know he thanked the man, before hanging up the call and turning around, looking at his friend, with a smile on his lips. Is something wrong? The freckled man asked curiously. We're here. Was the simple response of the smiling blonde. Those simple words made Izuku surprised, knowing perfectly well what he was referring to, the shelter. Apparently, they had fallen asleep longer than they thought. The green-haired man didn't waste any time and approached one of the windows that the plane had. As he did so, his eyes widened in amazement at what he was seeing. Between the mountains and a kind of forest, there was a kind of ancient-looking temple. Several planes could be seen landing near the place, as well as a huge number of people there. Melissa approached her friend, watching with amusement at his surprised face at the flirt's appearance. W where are we? Was the question that came from the boy's lips, almost by mere instinct. According to the owner of the place, we are in. Kamer Taj the blonde replied with a smile, looking at the great temple. Chapter 4. Sorcerer. The plane had landed outside the beautiful temple, but it wasn't just this one. Around the ancient-looking structure, there were a large number of planes, some of which landed in the designated area for these planes, and from which a large number of people were disembarking. These people didn't look very good, let's say, most of them were in a rather pitiful state, their clothes were worn and dirty, and several were seen with bandages, which looked new, and some parts even had blood stains on them. Other planes were taking off and leaving, moving away from the area, either in search of more survivors, or for supplies for the huge number of people living in Kamer Taj. Meanwhile, the plane in which Izuku was, along with Melissa and the other soldiers, had already landed in the corresponding area. As soon as the flying vehicle landed, its hatch opened, leaving a clear path for its crew to exit without problems. The moment they got off, the freckled man's gaze swept across everything he could see, noticing a huge number of people entering the temple, which seemed to be much larger than from the plane. It's incredible the green-haired man murmured, astonished, seeing the large number of people there there are so many people. 
Pandit Melissa would say with a smile as she approached her friend, standing next to him, observing with a slight amused smile the expression on his face due to the current situation. Several people lost their homes due to the great wave of villains all over the world, several cities became war zones, in fact. There are few cities that are still standing or have not been evacuated the blonde spoke as her smile disappeared, giving way to a serious and sad expression at the same time, seeing all the people who had lost their homes and families because of the war against Tamara and all for one. Izuku, likewise, frowned at the American blonde's words. He could only clench his fists in frustration at seeing all the pain those two monsters had caused, but he was forced out of his thoughts upon hearing Melissa's next words. Come on, let's go in, she would say, as she began to walk, followed by her soldiers. Izuku didn't hesitate and started walking next to Melissa. Don't stray, there are too many people here, so it's easy to get lost, said the blonde with glasses, while everyone was seen walking towards the entrance of the temple, being very close to each other, this due to the lack of space, or rather, the excessive amount of people. They all walked in complete silence towards the entrance of that temple, only being able to hear the footsteps of the people and how some of them lamented, either because of some fresh wounds still present on their bodies or because of the loss of a loved one because of the villains. The small group soon arrived at the entrance to the temple, which was a pair of large pillars on which a large amount of mold and cracks could clearly be seen, demonstrating how old the place was. As he crossed, Izuku opened his eyes in surprise at what his eyes managed to see. A large number of people, much larger than those at the entrance, some were sitting on the ground, barely having sheets or blankets, while others had entire large tents, there were even some stores, where many people were lining up to have a plate of food, which seemed to be a type of soup that he couldn't see well. It was certainly a daunting sight. Despite this, Melissa turned to look at her soldiers, who seemed to understand the blonde's gaze, dispersing and going to help the newcomers, while the girl with glasses had stayed with her green-haired friend. Well. She would say while letting out a small sigh I have to talk to the owner of the place, it might take a while, so. Try to get comfortable, explore the place if you want, just don't go too far. With nothing else to do, the green-haired boy nodded at his friend's words. He watched as the blonde disappeared into the crowd, to the point where he could no longer see her. Letting out a small sigh, Izuku began to walk around the place, he had nothing to do, so at least it would help him to get to know a little about that strange temple, which was now a refuge. As he walked, the freckled man had to be careful not to step on some of the people who were sitting or lying on the ground. There were so many people that it was difficult for him to walk. Everywhere he went, all he could see were homeless people. In reality, the boy did not know where to go, he tried to inspect the place, which was very difficult for him due to the large number of people. Hey, careful a man exclaimed angrily. Get out of my way. Don't get in the way. These were violent and aggressive words that could be heard from several people who were annoyed by the small space. The number of people was so great that one could not take two steps without accidentally stepping on one of the refugees who were sitting or lying on the ground. In addition to this, Izuku managed to see how several heavily armed soldiers were watching the place, either from inside some kind of towers or from the walls that surrounded the old palace, he could also see how outside of it, the planes took off and went in search of what he assumed were more refugees or supplies. After a few minutes of walking aimlessly, the green-haired man reached one of the walls that surrounded the shelter. Izuku didn't feel like doing anything, he was totally unmotivated, so he simply let himself fall to the ground, his back leaning against the wall, while letting out a heavy sigh, which reflected nothing more than tiredness. The green-haired man brought his hands to his face, while his mind was bombarded by endless memories, all of them completely horrible. Their family, her friends. They were all gone. Well, almost all of them, at least Melissa was there to keep her company, but for how long? Would she also lose her life in this war against Tamara? She knew perfectly well that the chances of this happening were high, but even so, he desperately clung to that small chance that she wouldn't die. I didn't want to lose any more friends, no more, I didn't feel like I could bear it. The freckled man was so immersed in his negative thoughts that he didn't notice that a person was approaching his position. Suddenly, a very familiar voice reached the freckled boy's ears, bringing him out of his thoughts. Izuku. Is that you? Upon hearing that voice, the aforementioned man came out of his thoughts almost instantly, raising his head and directing his gaze towards the source of that voice. Arodi. Izuku said with surprise and disbelief, looking at the owner of said voice. Just a few meters away from him was that young man he had met when Katsuki, Shodo and he had accompanied Endeavor to the city of Athian and who had helped him stop the Humorize organization. For a moment, the green-haired boy was very happy to see the brown-haired boy again, to see a friend again, and to know that he was still alive. However, that joy disappeared as soon as he saw the state the boy was in. 
His clothes, which already had several patches on them when she met him, were now tattered, completely dirty and with some blood stains. Rhodey's expression showed sadness and pain. He looked a little paler and even had large dark circles under his eyes. But worst of all was that the place where his right arm should have been, there was only a stump with some bandages. The freckled man's eyes widened in horror and disbelief. Brody. What happened to you? Was the only thing that came out of Izuku's mouth, although he already knew what could have happened, but he needed him to confirm it. A lot of things happened. Rody said as he approached Izuku, who sat next to him, hugging his legs with his only arm, his gaze sad and depressed. Due to the distance, the green-haired boy managed to see that little pink bird, which Rody called Pino, was on the boy's left shoulder, the bird's expression was completely sad, seeming to even be holding back the urge to burst into tears. I'm surprised to see you here, I mean, I thought you'd be in a shelter closer to your home, the former bearer of one for all would say nervously. The same can be said about you said the brown-haired boy, glancing at his friend, the nearby shelters were full to the brim with people, there was no more room, so I had to be transferred, along with other refugees, to another one, I suppose the same thing happened to you. Well. More or less. The situation in Japan is terrible, so much so that they even had to evacuate the entire country, since it had been completely conquered by the villains, explained the freckled man, surprising his friend. I see, I'm sorry to hear that. However, Izuku realized an extremely important detail. Just a second, Rody, where are your brothers? I asked, knowing how protective the boy was of his younger siblings, so there was no way he would separate himself from them at a time like this. However, the green-haired man had his answer when he saw how Rody squeezed his only hand very tightly, while biting his lip, to the point where it seemed like he was about to bleed. This quickly alarmed Izuku, who regretted asking that question. I am sorry, I didn't mean to. The freckled boy stammered. We tried to escape. Rody's weak and brittle voice interrupted Izuku's chatter, who watched as a tear fell down the brown-haired boy's left cheek, while Pino cried profusely, reflecting the true emotions that his user was trying to hide villains suddenly appeared and. Those monsters. Small fragments of memories of that horrible event, which had happened just a few days ago, passed through the chestnut's mind. Destruction everywhere, people running in fear, trying to save their lives. Villains fighting against the heroes, who were quickly overwhelmed by the sheer number of enemies. There were even Nomis, destroying everything in their path. Brody and his brothers ran in fear, trying to escape, heading to where the planes were to go to the shelters. However, an energy attack from one of the Nomis hit a building next to him, causing a huge explosion. Rody was stunned, a high-pitched sound buzzing in his ears annoyingly, through the dust and with his blurred vision, he could see the lifeless bodies of his younger brothers under some large rubble, while a large pool of blood formed under and around them. The brown-haired boy's horrified gaze was fixed on his already dead brothers, to the point that he didn't notice the disappearance of his arm, a product of the Nomu's attack. That was the image that Rody saw, before falling unconscious. After that, I woke up in one of the planes, one of the heroes who were in the area found me and saved me Rody said, his voice reflecting nothing but sadness and regret, as he remembered the death of the two most important people in his life. When the brown-haired boy had finished telling what happened, Izuku could only look at him sadly, knowing what it felt like to lose loved ones. He was not surprised by the fact that there were Nomis, Afo must have sent several of those monsters to his allies around the world, as extra help to face the heroes. I'm sorry that happened, I understand how you feel. I lost my mother and my friends, said the freckled man sadly as he remembered those he had lost in that war. I'm sorry about that. Rody would say, looking at his friend, who had the same expression of sadness and pain as him. Both of them, who had lost loved ones, could understand what he felt, they empathized with the other through that pain. After that conversation, both of them just stayed silent for a few minutes, they were simply too tired. But at that, Melissa's voice managed to make Izuku react. Izuku I finally found you the blonde said, approaching them both damn, this place is so big, I had to ask several of my soldiers to find you among all this crowd. Melissa, is something wrong? The freckled man asked confused. I already talked to the owner of the place, but he told me that he wants to see you Melissa explained, before noticing Rody's presence, who was looking at them curiously oh, sorry, I hadn't noticed you, are you Izuku's friend? The blonde asked kindly. Yes, nice to meet you, my name is Rody. the brown-haired boy greeted with his only arm. Nice to meet you, Rody. he returned the greeting. Melissa, why does the owner of the place want to talk to me? The green-haired man asked, confused and curious. He said that since you were one of the few who survived a direct fight with Tamura and Afo, you can give useful information, such as their abilities and quirks the blonde with glasses mentioned seriously. I understand, fine, then let's go the freckled man said with the same seriousness, before turning to see his armless friend I'm sorry, Rody, we'll continue talking later. 
No problem, good luck with whatever you have to do the brunette said vaguely, leaning against the wall behind him. Without saying anything else, Izuku began to follow Melissa, both of them walked for a few minutes, climbing some stairs to the central part of the temple, entering said area. The interior of the palace was very beautiful, having an ancient Asian style and giving an air of peace. The two young men arrived at a room where there were some desks and shelves with several books, which had an old appearance, showing how old they were. And, sitting in front of one of the desks, was a young-looking man, appearing to be in his twenties or twenties, his head was completely bald, his eyes were honey-colored, and he was wearing a red outfit with gold-colored edges. The man was reading a book with a calm expression, before noticing the presence of both young people, raising his gaze from the book. Mr. Wong, I already brought Izuku, as you requested Melissa would say in a respectful tone, to the man, now identified as Wong. I appreciate it, young Melissa the man said in a kind voice, looking up from his book to look at the green-haired boy welcome to my sanctuary, young Midoriya. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Wong, thank you for receiving me in your sanctuary, the freckled man said kindly. You have nothing to be thankful for, when I found out what was happening around the world, I just couldn't stand by and watch the bald man exclaimed, as he left the book on the desk and stood up, walking until he was in front of both young men, young Melissa told me a lot about you, she told me that you were apparently an apprentice of the hero All Might. And that you fought directly against Amura Shigaraki. Izuku glanced at Melissa at this, he knew that the information about One for All had spread throughout Japan, although he didn't know if it had spread to other countries, although he wouldn't be surprised if it had. Why yes, that's how it was. My friends and I tried everything to stop him, but. We didn't succeed, everyone lost their lives, currently I'm the only survivor said the freckled man with regret and sadness as he remembered his fallen friends. I'm sorry to hear that, young Midoriya, everyone has lost someone in this war the man said sadly about the situation that was happening around the world. I understand, but Melissa told me she wanted to talk to me. Indeed, you are the only one who has survived a direct encounter with Tamura Shigaraki, so you could be of great help to us in a counter-attack against him, Wong spoke seriously and firmly. I'm sorry, but. I don't think I can be of much use to you, Tamura. I'm taking away my quirk the green-haired man explained, while lowering his head as he remembered that event and clenching his fists tightly. This information left Melissa surprised, while Wong just calmly looked at the freckled boy. I'm sorry to hear that, but still, not all is lost, we still have a chance to defeat Tamura, and you can help us, Wong would say with a small smile. These words caused confusion in the freckled boy, which was perfectly reflected in his expression, being captured by Melissa and Wong. What do you mean? I can't be of much use, I don't have my quirk anymore, without it I'm useless he said sadly and helplessly. You see, young Midoriya, several of the soldiers who help us have had a problem very similar to yours, their quirks were stolen, but very few managed to get out alive from Tamura's clutches, not to mention several quirkless, who wanted to help, but didn't have the power to do so. So I gave them the power so they can help the bald man explained with a smile. These words left the freckled man completely surprised, who fixed his gaze on the man in red. Did he give them power? But how? Does he have a quirk that allows him to provide an increase in physical capabilities to others? Izuku asked, intrigued and confused by the man's words. No, young Midori Wong said, as he calmly walked towards a small table, pouring himself some tea quirks or thanks to a very specific gene in the individual's body, although today, there are several theories about the origin of these. Yeah. But, what would you say if I told you that an individual can be given a new and better power, without the need for a gene to produce it? Wong asked calmly, while Melissa smiled a little, knowing where the conversation was going. However, Izuku had something completely different in mind. Why you? Are you talking about creating quirks? The ability to artificially create a gift and successfully implant it into a host. The freckled man asked in shock at the thought that this man had managed to create such a thing, is that why you were keeping it hidden? To keep this safe. Please tell me, how experimental is the process? Quite a bit. Wong replied, leaving his tea on the table, while looking at the boy with a calm and amused smile at the same time but, Actually, you're wrong, young man, we don't have something like that, what we do here is reorient the spirit to improve the body. The spirit? The green-haired man asked confused, before shaking his head slightly. No, it's okay. Please tell me, how can I undergo that treatment? He exclaimed, hoping to be of help and defeat Tamara. Wong didn't say anything, he simply grabbed a nearby book and opened it to a specific page, approaching the green-haired man and showing him the page of the book, revealing an image of the types of chakras in the body. This only confused the freckled man. Is something wrong, young man? Wong asked with an amused smile. I think, I'm confused. I see, and what do you think of this one? This time, Wong turned the page, showing him a picture of the parts of the human body that were used in acupuncture. 
Izuku only had an expression of complete confusion at this, while well, little by little that hope and illusion he felt a few seconds ago faded and was replaced by pure disappointment. And this one. The bald man turned the page again, this time showing the image of a common MRI of an entire human body. I can't believe it. Izuku would say, letting out a heavy sigh of disappointment, as he stepped back. Each of those maps was drawn by someone who could see part of it, but not the whole Wong explained, while leaving the book on a table. Mr. Wong, I'm sorry, but I don't understand what you're saying. Are you referring to something like the power of faith? Izuku asked, as he looked up and saw the man. The boy didn't want to sound rude, but such disappointment had put him in a bad mood. What he heard so far seemed like something invented by some cliché sect that only wanted to make money. I know it may sound strange and fanciful, I don't blame you, many have doubted at the beginning, but this is not some trick, it is real, and it may be our last hope if we want to defeat Tamara and Afo Wong said, changing his tone and expression to a more serious one. I beg your pardon, Mr. Wong, I am very grateful for the help you have given to these people by staying in your temple, and to me too, but what I'm hearing is hard to believe. What you're saying sounds like something out of some kind of cheap sect, we can't defeat Tamura with the power of faith and love, we need real power, Izuku's tone gradually rose as he spoke, until he ended up almost shouting the last part in anger. Despite this, Wong just remained completely calm, looking into the freckled man's eyes. As did Melissa, who watched the scene with a small smile. Power like. This. After those words, Wong quickly hit the boy's chest with his open palm. What happened next was that some sort of ghostly copy of Izuku emerged from his body, slowly floating in the air. The freckled boy looked in shock at his own semi-transparent being, at the same time as his own body seemed to fall in super slow motion, but despite this, Melissa approached and prevented his body from falling. With a simple movement of his fingers, Wong made the boy return to his body, recompassing himself with the help of Melissa. W what was that? The green-haired man exclaimed in shock, touching his body almost instinctively. Nothing interesting, I just separated your astral form from your physical form, Wong explained casually, while the American blonde watched the scene unimpressed. An illusion quirk. The boy asked, trying to decipher what happened. The freckled boy's words only brought small, amused smiles from both Wong and Melissa. Tiled, for a moment, you entered the astral dimension. The one. The world where the soul exists, separate from the body Wong explained calmly, looking directly at Izuku, while approaching him young Midoriya, there is still much you do not know, the quirks, they are only the tip of the iceberg. Open your third eye. But those last words, Wong placed his thumb in the middle of Izuku's forehead. The next thing that happened was that the green-haired man had flown towards the ground, breaking the ceiling as if it were paper, but not suffering the slightest damage. What's going on? He shouted in disarray, while he felt the wind hit his face hard. His eyes widened as he realized he had reached the outskirts of the planet in seconds, easily seeing the continents. Against all logic, the boy saw in front of him a small emerald green butterfly, flying as if nothing had happened. Despite how strange and weird the situation was, the green-haired man stretched out his hand, trying to touch her, to find out if what was happening was real or not. For a brief moment, he managed to touch the butterfly, feeling it against his skin. But the instant he touched it, his body flew off into the horizon. Space itself seemed to warp around him, as the speed only increased more and more with each instant. Bright, intense colors appeared all over the place, illuminating the freckled man's vision. Don't you think you're going a little too far? Melissa's voice was heard perfectly, despite the strange situation that was happening. Suddenly, the boy's body changed direction, as if he were being pulled. Within a millisecond, he was back in the room, falling suddenly into a chair, which was being held by Wong. Looks good to me the bald man would say with a calm smile, looking at the boy. Without being able to say anything, Izuku was once again launched at an enormous speed, while the space around him was once again deformed into that mixture of colors, which changed rapidly. Do you think you know how the world works? Do you think this material world is all there is? Wong's voice echoed calmly in the freckled man's ears, contrasting with the chaotic landscape that surrounded him. That colorful space disappeared in less than a second, revealing that Izuku was now in outer space, in front of a kind of supermassive black hole, which seemed to beat as if it were a heart. A strong yellow light came out of said black hole, ending up absorbing the boy in thousandths of a second, who could only scream at what was happening. What is real? Izuku's body seemed to turn to dust in seconds and reassemble itself instantly. As he emerged from the black hole, the freckled man saw that he was in a kind of dimension compassed purely of what appeared to be lava, while enormous moons and planets made of obsidian and magma levitated everywhere. What mysteries are hidden beyond the reach of your senses? Reality itself began to warp, creating shapes Izuku couldn't describe, something that seemed straight out of a kaleidoscope. At the origin of existence, mind and matter meet and it is the thoughts themselves that shape reality. 
The space around Izuku became a kind of amalgam made purely of infinite hands, which grabbed one of the freckled boy's feet, beginning to surround him. He desperately tried to break free, but it was in vain, as the hands ended up surrounding his entire body. However, all those hands ended up turning into dust, and that place became a totally dark void. Izuku's body began to fall towards the same nothingness, while a strong glow illuminated the entire place. This universe is just one of an infinite number, infinite worlds that represent infinite possibilities. When he realized it, the freckled boy was floating in a dark violet space, while an uncountable amount of bright red bubbles were floating everywhere, there were so many that the boy couldn't see an end. Some universes are benevolent, granting life. The young man's body moved on its own, flying in the direction of one of the bubbles, watching as it was replaced by a copy of the planet Earth, a copy which began to collapse, while the darkness consumed it little by little, until nothing was left and finally, the bubble disappeared. And others filled with evil and darkness, where powers older than existence itself lie hungry and waiting. Izuku screamed in terror as he watched thousands of those bubbles begin to disappear, being consumed by the darkness itself, until not a single trace of their existence remained, disappearing in a spectacle of cosmic destruction. But. In less than a blink of an eye, the green-haired boy was now floating peacefully in a kind of ocean, where there were millions of stars in the water. Who are you in this vast multiverse, young Midoriya? Wang's voice this time was heard as a very light whisper. That piece disappeared and the boy's body shot out like a comet, while he seemed like he was going to convulse. Once again, the space around him deformed into a kind of light tube, filled with different colors, for a brief second, before Izuku returned to that room where it all began, falling hard to the ground before the eyes of Wong and Melissa. Have you ever seen that in a scammer sect? The bald man asked with an amused smile. With great difficulty, the boy stood up, barely able to kneel on the ground, looking at Wong, while his body trembled from the astral experience he had just suffered. He please. Teach me the boy begged, looking at the bald man. He was now completely convinced that it had not been a mere illusion quirk, he knew it. It had felt so real, not even the best illusion quirks would be able to create something like that. Now the doubts had disappeared. Okay. Izuku blinked in confusion at the man's quick response. He had expected the man to test him or even reject him, he didn't think the man would agree to teach him so quickly. Ah oh, really? Just like that? I asked with intrigue. Of course, that's all. Aren't you going to test me or something? Izuku asked, confused and intrigued. At this, Wong looked at the boy as if he was an idiot for asking him such a question. Boy, do you know the situation we're in? We're in possibly the most dangerous and important war that has occurred since the appearance of the quirks, and the worst thing is that we're losing. It's been confirmed that several countries have already fallen to Tamura, not just Japan, we're in a very bad position, and we need as many soldiers as possible as soon as possible. We don't have time to waste on absurd tests, Melissa has already told me about you, and I can see that you're a good person, that's enough for me the bald man had spoken with a serious expression. Izuku understood what the man meant and couldn't deny it, the current situation was more than critical, heroes were no longer needed. In war, what was needed were soldiers ready to fight and eliminate their target, and that target was Tamura Shigaraki. But. Even so, since I didn't do anything to earn it, the freckled man muttered under his breath. Both Wong and Melissa sighed, and even the bald man rolled his eyes at this. Hid, that's just nonsense Wong sighed with some exasperation. At this, Izuku looked up, staring at the man in confusion. Earn it? Do you really think it matters if you earned it? The man said with a serious look young man, it doesn't matter if you earned that power or if you were born with it, if you worked hard to get it, or if you've always had it, in the end, none of that matters. Do you think your enemies care even a little about the origin of your power? No, they don't care nobody cares if you worked hard or not to have the power, the only thing that really matters is whether you can control it or not, if you are strong or not, if you can defeat your enemies or not, that's what matters. The green-haired man's eyes were open as wide as his anatomy would allow as he listened to Wong's words and pondered them. Several times, he had thought that he hadn't tried hard enough to have one for all, that he hadn't done anything to deserve it. But, the words of the man in front of him were making him realize that it didn't really matter. It didn't matter if he had earned it or not. In fact, it seemed like he was trying to prove it to someone, but who? All Might. No. Rather, it seemed like he wanted to prove it to himself, to prove to himself that he had earned it. Now, with a new vision and determination running through him, the boy stood up, looking seriously at the apparent sorcerer. He understood it now, it didn't matter if he had earned it, what mattered was winning that damn war and finishing off Tamura and Afo. So. When do we start? Izuku asked, his gaze reflecting pure seriousness. Both Melissa and Wong smiled with pleasure at this, knowing that they had one more soldier in their ranks. Chapter 5. Training. 
only a few minutes had passed since Wang had demonstrated the existence of magic to Izuku, agreeing to train him so he could defeat Tamara. Currently, the green-haired boy was following Melissa, who was leading him to one of the rooms so he could rest and be ready for his training. It's incredible that something like this exists the freckled man had commented, still being amazed by the existence of magic. This only brought a small, amused smile to the blonde. I can tell you were very surprised. How could I not be surprised? Whatever Mr. Wong has done to me, it is beyond the limits of any quirk the freckled man commented, feeling a chill as he remembered when the man had sent his soul on a kind of astral journey through the multiverse. Compared to others, you accepted him very quickly, you should have seen me at the beginning, I didn't believe a single word, Wong said Melissa said with an amused smile, remembering her first days in Kamer Taj. Izuku could perfectly understand what his friend was referring to, after all, she was a woman of science, and the fact that magic existed was something that would be very difficult for her to believe. And? Do you know what the training will be like? The green-haired man asked, trying to find out something about how the use and control of magic was learned. At this, Melissa looked over her shoulder at him, giving him a small smile. You'll have to find out that yourself tomorrow, I'll just tell you that. Suddenly, she took the shield from her back, which, to Izuku's surprise, was surrounded by a kind of orange circle of light, which emitted a slight glow of the same color magic is very useful Melissa would say with a smile, before making the magic circle on her shield disappear, placing it back on her back. All this, before the astonished gaze of the freckled man. Incredible, what else can you do with magic? He asked, coming out of his surprise. Hey, you'll have to see that tomorrow too, it's easier than just explaining it with words. But, there's something I don't understand Izuku would say, drawing the girl's attention, if Mr. Wong had such a power all this time, why didn't you reveal it to the world? He could have helped many people. Things aren't always that easy, Izuku. Mr. Wong keeps a lot of secrets, but you have to understand that it's for the good of everyone the blonde said seriously, leaving her friend thoughtful at these words. After those words, the blonde stopped walking, opening the door to the room where Izuku would sleep. Upon entering, he saw that there were at least eight more people, apart from him, in that room. Sorry, but we use all the space possible the girl with glasses would say. Don't worry, I understand the green-haired man replied. Well, you better rest, see you tomorrow, Izuku Melissa said goodbye, before leaving the room. Izuku just said goodbye to his friend, before settling down on a few blankets on the floor, watching as the other people slept, some in positions that looked quite uncomfortable. There were no beds in the room, just a few mattresses on the floor, along with stains and the occasional futon, not to mention that the room was somewhat small, being in short, quite uncomfortable. But, this did not matter in the least to the freckled boy, who only had one thing in mind, learning magic, to put an end to that madness once and for all. But that thought in mind, he closed his eyes, falling into the arms of Morpheus. The next morning, it was a new day for all the refugees in the ancient temple of Kamer Taj, where everyone was hiding from the horrors that the villains had unleashed on the rest of the countries. But, this day was special especially for the young man with green hair, who was in a room, alone with him and Wong. Both were sitting on the floor, with the sorcerer explaining to the young man the basics of magic, it was the most basic thing to begin his training. The language of the mystic arts is as old as civilization itself, much older than quirks. The sorcerers of antiquity called it a spell for the use they gave it, but, putting it in a simpler way, it could be said that it is a program, that code that shapes reality the bald sorcerer explained, while Izuku paid extreme attention to every word he said. By controlling energy. At that, Wang began to move his hands as he continued with the explanation, slowly generating a bright orange magic circle that we extract from other dimensions of the multiverse, we cast spells. We use said energy to conjure shields and weapons. In short, we do magic. As he finished his explanation, the magic circle emitted a slightly more intense glow, floating in front of the young man's face for a few brief moments, before disappearing into particles of light, leaving the boy astonished. The most important thing is that there are no secrets or shortcuts for this, the best and only way to learn this is with study and practice, it's that simple said the bald man, before giving a small smile to the green-haired man, before standing up come with me, I have to show you something. After saying those words, the man turned around, starting to walk, leaving that room, being followed by Izuku. After walking through some corridors of the ancient temple, they both came to a kind of ancient library, full of books of all kinds. Impressive, isn't it? Wong would say, as they both walked through the halls of the place, seeing the large number of old books in these books is all the information you could ever need about magic and different spells. Izuku just stared in amazement at the large number of books, while listening to the sorcerer's words. At that, Wong would take some books and hand them to the freckled man, who looked confused at this. The Book of the Invisible Sun, Astronomy Nova, Codex Imperium, The Key of King Solomon. 
These books can help you get started, don't be guided by the titles, in fact these are the most basic ones there are. Melissa also read them when she started learning a couple of months ago, Wong explained with a small smile. I understand, thank you Mr. Wong the freckled man would say with a grateful smile. They were both about to leave the place, when Izuku noticed a book that ended up catching his attention. Mr. Wong, what are those books? I asked, pointing to a pair of shelves, where there were several books. These were divided into two kinds, some were green with gold decorations, and the others were dark purple with silver details. At this question, the man's expression changed to a more serious and firm one. They are the private collection of the Sorcerer Supreme. Are they forbidden? The boy asked, while his gaze analyzed the books on both shelves. No knowledge in Kamertaj is forbidden, but there are some practices that are too advanced for beginners, those books are exclusive to anyone who is not the Sorcerer Supreme. And I suppose that would be you said the freckled man, glancing sideways at Wong, who nodded in affirmation of his doubt. Izuku slowly approached those books, just by looking at the green ones, he could tell that great power was hidden within them. However, the moment his gaze fell on the purple ones, a horrible chill ran through his body, as if his own instincts were telling him that whatever was written on those pages was dangerous. Wong seemed to notice this, so he approached the young man. Those books, the purple ones, are the only ones forbidden in all of Kamertaj, they are books of black magic, they contain spells that are extremely dangerous for anyone the man explained, answering the question that was on the young man's mind, we protect them here, so that no one can use them. They are sealed with a special spell, so that only a high-level sorcerer can open them and read their pages. But. You had said that the origin of the power did not matter the freckled man questioned somewhat doubtfully. There are exceptions, child. Some powers carry too high a price, you better concentrate on learning the basics of magic, and then we'll move on to something more advanced, but forget about those books the sorcerer said firmly and seriously. Wong turned around, starting to leave the library, Izuku followed him, but not before taking one last look at those books, but especially at the purple ones of black magic. He shook his head, pushing those thoughts from his mind, before following the sorcerer supreme. Meanwhile, in Japan, things were not going well at all. In the rubble of what was once the Hero Academy, the UA, were two people, two white-haired men dressed in elegant suits. Tamura Shigaraki and all for one. I'm really impressed, Tamura, you managed to exceed all my expectations, said the number one villain, looking at his apprentice with an evil smile, but without losing that elegant touch that characterized him, it makes me very happy that you have left those ridiculous excuses behind and accepted your true self. That's right, Sensei. Tamura exclaimed with a dark look and a macabre smile, looking his teacher in the eyes I was so stupid, so blind. I refused to see reality. I was a coward, I hid my own being under those ridiculous things that society had made me like this. But, the truth is that this is what I have always been, what I will always be. And I love it, I am not a victim of society, I am just destruction. And I do not need to continue deceiving myself, now that I have accepted it, there is nothing that limits me from doing everything I want. Afo smiled delightedly at this, he was sick of hearing Tamura victimize himself all the time, complaining about how society had made him like this. But he knew the truth, Tamura had always been a monster, but he refused to see it. But, she had already managed to open his eyes, that brat who complained about society and played the victim no longer existed, he had finally become the villain he was destined to be. Well. Now there's only one thing left to do. Afo said, as he got a little closer to his student Tamura. I don't have much time left, this body is no longer useful to me. No matter how much I rejuvenate it with the copy I made of that girl's quirk, nothing works anymore. Now, the time has come to leave everything to my legacy. The villain raised his right hand, which was surrounded by a thick dark purple aura. It seemed like the atmosphere in the place had become much more tense with just that action. Tamura looked at his master's hand in amazement after hearing those words. Now, Tamura. Give me your hand for one last time. Finally claim the power you have earned and reduce this world to nothing but ashes, let your evil and selfish desires consume everything the white-haired man said firmly, while a dark and evil smile appeared on his face, while his eyes emitted a sinister red glow. Instantly, Tamura drew a huge evil smile on his face. He didn't hesitate for a second. With the memory of when he met Afo, he raised his hand and took his master's. Instantly, both of them were surrounded by a dark purple aura, before a massive pillar of said energy formed and rose into the skies, breaking through the clouds, as a powerful earthquake forcefully struck what was once a city. After a few seconds, that pillar of energy disappeared and the earthquake stopped. Where there had been only rubble before, there was now a huge crater at least a kilometer long and half a kilometer deep. And in the middle of this crater, there was only one person. Tamura Shigaraki. Afo was no longer there, he had left everything to his student. 
The white-haired boy opened his eyes, which were now dark purple, emitting a sinister glow, a glow which reflected nothing but pure evil. A macabre and cruel smile appeared on the subject's lips. He clenched his fists firmly, causing his left arm to be surrounded by red rays with a black glow, while his right arm was surrounded by bright emerald green rays. He could feel it, he now had the complete all for one, and the one for all that he had stolen from Izuku. Thanks to his enormous will, he had managed to subdue the wills of the former bearers, taking full control of that quirk, along with the hundreds of thousands of quirks that his master had stolen throughout his centuries of life. Now, all the power was to Murris. It was all for him. It's time to destroy. Was the only thing the white-haired man said, his voice reflecting nothing but evil. Back in Kamer Taj, about five days had passed since the freckled man had arrived at that place, and he had already begun his training in magic. Something that took him by surprise was the fact that Rhodey had decided to join the training. It turns out that there were several people who were recruited for training and learning magic, this was due to the small number of soldiers they had, a number which was reduced more and more, with each mission they went on, whether to search for supplies or new survivors. Izuku had been very surprised to find out that his friend had joined of his own free will to train. He had asked him why this was happening, and the brown-haired boy had told him that the soldiers had explained to him that he could gain power and be of great help. Melissa had also talked to him and had given him a little demonstration about the power of magic, which had left him in shock. That was enough to convince him, Rhodey was not exactly a fighter, but at that moment he had only one goal in mind, and that was to finish off Tamura Shigaraki, who was responsible for starting that war, and therefore, responsible for the death of his brothers. When the brown-haired boy had explained this to Izuku, he could see a flame of hatred, determination and revenge in his eyes. The freckled boy understood this feeling perfectly, he too had lost almost everyone he cared about because of that madman. This only made him understand that there were many people who wanted to see Tamura dead, people who had lost everything, and that the only thing they had left was a mission, the mission to finish off that monster. Currently, in one of the training camps of the Great Temple, there were a large number of people, both men and women, adults and even teenagers, all had volunteered to train and become magicians to help in the war, some out of a sense of justice, others because they wanted revenge on Tamura, and others because they had nothing left. They were being trained by Wong himself, who took them seriously. Among these people were Izuku, Rodi, and Melissa. With an order from the man, everyone stood at attention, with another order they moved their arms, forming circles of light in their hands, which they broke with a blow, disappearing in sparks of light. Several were succeeding, as in the case of Melissa, who already had quite advanced control, this thanks to the fact that she had been doing it for longer than most. However, others like Rodi and Izuku were showing difficulties, especially the brown-haired one, who was barely able to make a few sparks appear with his only arm. Izuku looked sideways as his friend was quite frustrated by the little progress he was making. Even though he had only started a few days ago, he knew they didn't have much time, they didn't know if Tamura was going to end up finding that place, so he wanted to learn as quickly as possible. Mastering the rings is something fundamental in the mystical arts Wang explained, while his new students took a kind of golden ring, they are not just a simple accessory, they are a powerful artifact that allows us to travel throughout the multiverse. At this information, the green-haired boy's eyes widened as he stared at the ring. The mere idea that he could go anywhere with that small object was fascinating to him. In fact, she wondered why such objects were not used instead of planes to search for survivors. But, as quickly as that question came, it was gone, the number of magicians in the temple was very low, according to Melissa, and there were even fewer who could use such rings, since they were not exactly easy to use. But, leaving that aside, the memory of that astral journey that Wong had sent him on came to his mind. A small shiver ran through his body as he thought about what kind of things could be hidden in the multiverse. Honestly, it was something he preferred not to know, rather concentrate on what was happening in his own universe. You just have to concentrate, visualize. See in your minds where you want to go. Following the instructions given by the Supreme Sorcerer, he closed his eyes and began to concentrate, thinking about his room in the temple. Izuku spread both hands, one fixed in front while he spun the other in circles, having the image of his target in mind. Look beyond the world in front of you, imagine every detail. The clearer the image, the sooner and faster you can open the portal. Opening his eyes slightly, the freckled boy managed to see a small circle of orange sparks begin to form in front of him. It was small, looking like only a small dog or cat could fit inside, and it seemed quite unstable. But despite this, he managed to get a happy and excited smile out of the young man, it was progress. On the other hand, the bald man looked sideways at Rhodey with a frustrated and annoyed face, seeing how he could not conjure the portal, barely managing to produce a few small sparks, while moving his only arm. Finish Wong ordered, ending that training session I want to talk alone with young Rhodey. 
At the sorcerer's words, everyone present began to leave the place, including Izuku, who sent a worried look to the young brown-haired boy, who approached his master with his head down. It's my arm, right? I asked dejectedly. It's not your arm. It has to be my arm, I know it the boy complained, irritated and frustrated. At this, Wang just smiled amusedly, calling over a student of his. Brody's eyes widened as he watched a man in his thirties, who was missing his right arm and left hand, manage to make a magic circle, using only that stump. After thanking his student, Wong turned his gaze back to the surprised boy. It's okay to want to progress quickly, but you can't expect your progress to be the same as everyone else's. You have to remember that you're not them. You move at your own pace. Over-demanding yourself will only frustrate you more and in the end you'll stagnate in one place the man said with a serious look. Brody only lowered his head slightly at the word spoken by his master, squeezing his only hand slightly. But. If you want to advance faster, there are also more. Extreme options using his ring, Wong would open a portal, which he would enter, followed by the brown-haired boy. As he crossed the portal, the boy's eyes widened as he saw how he had been transported to a huge snowy mountain, instantly feeling the enormous cold that existed in that place. He this is. Mount Everest Wong would say, answering Rodi's doubts, without seeming affected by the cold it's beautiful he said, looking at the snowy landscape from the top of the mountain. Why yes, you're right, it is beautiful. Freezing, but. Beautiful Rodi replied, stuttering from the cold, clinging to his brown coat with his one arm. At this temperature, a person can't survive for 30 minutes before suffering permanent damage. El nice. The boy said somewhat nervously. But you will be in shock in just two. These words made the young man open his eyes in shock as he realized his master's intentions. Progress, child was the last thing the bald man said, before leaving through the portal, leaving Rodi alone on the top of that mountain. Back in Kamer Taj, Wong was patiently waiting for his student to return on his own, when he heard footsteps behind him, none other than Melissa. Excuse me Mr. Wong, have you seen Rodi? The blonde asked. I'll tell you now, at any time the man responded simply. At this, the girl's eyes widened in concern as she guessed what the man had done. Not again. I murmur, since, indeed, Wong had already performed said action with other students. Seconds passed and there was no sign of Rodi, which began to worry Melissa. Maybe I should. She said, trying to take out her ring to open a portal, but being interrupted by Wong. From Everest, Rodi desperately tried to open the portal, to no avail, only increasing his frustration. He couldn't help but shiver from the enormous cold he felt, clinging to his coat with his only hand in search of some warmth. However, the memory of Wong's words came to his mind. Closing his eyes, he let out a sigh, beginning to relax as much as he could, relaxing his shoulders as he visualized in his mind every detail of the place he wanted to go. I'm not like them, I shouldn't force it, the brown-haired man thought, while he concentrated as much as he could, removing all the stress from his mind and only concentrating on opening the portal. At the temple, both Wong and Melissa were beginning to worry about Rodi as they watched the seconds pass and there was no trace of him. At one point, the bald man was considering bringing him back himself. But, those thoughts disappeared the moment a portal opened in front of them both and the brown-haired man emerged from it with one arm. Rodi fell to the ground as soon as he returned, shivering from the cold and covered in snow. A satisfied smile appeared on Melissa and Wong's faces as they watched the one-armed young man progress at his own pace, displaying a talent for magic. Melissa told me that you're already progressing with magic, it seems that you learn quickly the green-haired man would say, looking at his one-armed friend with a smile. Yes, apparently there are people with more affinity for magic than others, Rodi said with a smile, while reading a magic book, being helped by his bird, Pino, which passed the magic through him. Both young people talked happily, the fact that they were progressing in their new magical abilities was lifting their spirits and having a friend to talk to helped their moods a lot. Currently, Izuku was reading a book of elemental magic. There was just one detail, and that was the fact that he was in the same astral form as when Wong had shown him that magic existed. After having practiced and studied about this technique, the young man was now able to access the astral dimension at will. Without a doubt, magic was something fascinating for both of them. They knew the quirks were strong, but magic far surpassed them, especially because of how versatile it was, not limited to a single ability like gifts, but wizards could have a large repertoire of different abilities for different scenarios. Still, there is something that worries me the brown-haired man would say with a more serious look, stopping his reading. This caught Izuku's attention, who looked up from his book to see his friend as he returned to his body and recompassed himself. What are you talking about? I mean, I feel like Mr. Wong is hiding a lot of things, it's. 
A strange feeling the one-armed boy would say thoughtfully, while well, his little pink bird had a serious and confused expression, showing the emotions of its user I mean, that out of nowhere a powerful sorcerer comes out with powers that are apparently much older than Quirks, there must be something behind all that. Izuku remained silent for a second at this, thinking about the words said by the brown-haired man. It is true that Mr. Wong seems to keep secrets he said seriously, while he remembered for a second the books of black magic, which he had been told never to touch. He just shook his head a little, pushing those thoughts away, but he has been very good to us, we have no reason to distrust him. I know, but. Aren't you even a little curious? I mean, we don't know anything about him the young brown-haired boy mentioned. I'd be lying if I said no. Was the only thing the freckled boy said, before letting out a small sigh anyway, it's best that we continue with our training, there's still a lot we have to learn. Brody would only nod at these words, as it was true. The Sorcerer Supreme may keep secrets, but so far he hadn't shown the slightest reason to distrust him, so it would be best to continue concentrating on his training. A couple of days later. Currently, Izuku and Melissa were training in hand-to-hand -hand combat, while nearby, Wong supervised other students. Despite the training, the freckled man couldn't help but glance at the bald man, several questions about the guy still running through his mind. He turned his gaze to his blonde friend, who was preparing to continue with the training. Melissa, you've known Wong longer than us, do you know anything about him? I asked curiously, wanting to at least satisfy her great curiosity a little. The blonde looked at her friend as she got a little closer to him. Mr. Wong keeps many secrets, many are for people's safety, others are more personal matters, said the young woman with glasses, he has confided some of those secrets to me, don't expect me to tell you she finished with a small smile, already having in mind what the freckled man wanted. Seeing that he had been easily discovered, the young man blushed slightly in embarrassment. It's just that. I'm curious. Well, you know what they say, curiosity killed the cat Melissa got into a combat stance, being imitated by Izuku, you just have to know that he is a good person, he helped me move on after the loss of my father, and he has helped a lot of people. After saying those words, the blonde kicked the young man in the face, which he managed to dodge in time, before tackling her, trying to knock her down. However, she grabbed him by the wrists, managing to keep him at bay. Don't worry, Wong will tell you when he feels it's necessary the blonde would say, before quickly moving to apply a key around the freckled man's neck. Izuku gave Melissa a strong elbow in the stomach, thus managing to free herself from that key. That was too many questions the girl would say with a smile, while taking a kind of ancient-looking cane. What's that? It's a question he said with an amused smile, eliciting a small laugh from his friend it's a relic, there is magic that is impossible to bear, so we infuse it into objects, so that they bear it for us, this is the staff of the living tribunal. As she finished her explanation, the staff separated into several sections, which glowed orange, now the staff acted more like a kind of whip, which was demonstrated when Melissa hit the ground with it, generating a few sparks, before the weapon returned to normal. There are many relics, the Watum staff, Valter's flipping boots, or the Swarga shield. Weren't there more difficult names? The freckled man asked with a somewhat ironic and amused smile, when will I get my relic? When you're ready. Well, how do we know if I'm ready? You'll know when the relic decides that you are Melissa replied somewhat enigmatically. He, I think you've spent too much time surrounded by wizards, an amused smile appeared on the freckled boy's lips at those words. Maybe was the response of an equally amused Melissa for now, conjure a weapon. Nodding at his friend's words, Izuku concentrated, clenching his fists as magic circles appeared in them, and his forearms were surrounded by an orange glow. I've always been more of a fist fighter she would say with a tiny smile, while getting into a fighting stance. Well, that will do. Immediately, Melissa would attack using the staff, causing Izuku to step back and cover himself with her fist surrounded by magic. I'd fight as if your life depended on it, the blonde shouted at him, while attacking the young man with great speed, demonstrating quite a bit of experience in combat. Izuku managed to block the attacks with his fists, before throwing a punch at her, which Melissa dodged as well. Quickly, a small magic circle appeared in the young woman's free hand, summoning her shield, which she would throw against her opponent. The freckled boy would manage to narrowly avoid the weapon, not noticing how it would bounce off the walls, since Melissa was controlling him with her magic, causing him to end up hitting the boy with a sword, knocking him down to the ground, where she would immobilize him, putting her staff in front of his face. I win he said with a small smile, before helping his friend up. All this being seen by Wong, who put on a small smile when he saw the performance of his students. The next day, the green-haired boy was walking through the temple courtyard, watching how different people were doing their best to cope with the current situation. On his face you could see some pretty noticeable dark circles, this due to the fact that even before arriving at the temple, Izuku had suffered from horrible nightmares, just like the one he had suffered on the plane when he was heading to that shelter for the first time. 
In these nightmares, the same scenario always happened, the figure of the damned Tamura mercilessly killing all his friends and loved ones, without him being able to do anything. Despite everything, the enormous guilt he felt for not having been able to do anything to save them was still intact upon him, reflected in those horrible nightmares. These events only made the freckled boy dedicate himself even more to his training, seeking to increase his power to finish off Tamura once and for all, not only to end that war, but also for the personal reason that was the deaths of his friends and family. What the boy didn't realize was that the same desire for power was beginning to cloud his judgment. That desire for power was slowly beginning to turn into something darker. The determination and resentment he had for the albino were twisting that desire, turning it into an obsession that couldn't lead to anything good. However, the freckled man was so deep in his thoughts that he had not noticed that a person had noticed his presence and was approaching him. Wow, I never thought I'd see you again, much less here said a female voice, which Izuku instantly recognized, coming out of his thoughts and directing his gaze towards the source of said voice, it's nice to see you again. Little hero. Chapter 6. Forgot your flaws. Izuku's gaze reflected nothing but total surprise, as he looked at the purple-haired woman in front of him. He recognized her instantly, Kainitsutsumi Lady Nagant, the former heroine, who was sent to the maximum security prison, Tartaros, for having murdered the former president of the Hero Association. Memories of when he met the woman came to the boy's mind, which was when she had gone to kidnap him, on all for one's orders, although in the end he managed to make her reconsider. Although she had been seriously injured for disobeying Afo, she had managed to recover shortly after, after that, the last thing he heard of her, was that she had been helping in the war in different battles. Without a doubt, he had not expected to find her here at all. The woman gave a small amused smile as she saw the shocked expression on the freckled young man's face, finding it somewhat amusing. Hey, you seem to be surprised to see me, right, Brad? The woman asked amused, managing to get the boy out of his thoughts. He well, it is a surprise to see you again, kinda, I haven't heard from you in months, I thought that. The freckled man didn't finish speaking, feeling somewhat nervous with that thought, something that was noticed by the woman. Did I die? Heh, just barely, but I survived the sniper exclaimed with a smile, although I must admit, I am quite surprised to find you here. Yes, the other shelters near Japan were full, so this was the only option I had. I see the purple-haired girl would say, before smiling with an idea in mind come on, kid, we have a lot to catch up on, besides, could you show me around, it's almost like a maze with so many people. The freckled boy just nodded, beginning to walk with the purple-haired girl through that ancient temple. And tell me, what have you done in this time? Izuku asked, looking curiously at the sniper. Aina looked thoughtful for a few seconds, as if she was remembering the mission she had to go through before arriving at that temple, until after a few seconds, she turned her gaze to the boy and answered. Well, after I recovered from my explosive incident she would say with a wry smile, referring to when she almost died due to the safety method that Afo had implanted in her, I enlisted to help as quickly as possible, I was sent to help a squadron in the United States New York. The green-haired man was a little surprised by this information, he knew well that due to the critical situation that was occurring around the world, several heroes and soldiers from different countries were sent to help other countries, which were in worse situations, this to try to stop the great advance that the villains had. And, after Japan, the United States was the country that was having the worst time, due to the death of its number one heroine, and they received any help that other countries could give them. Once I was there, I worked for a while with a group of heroes, among them there was one who turned into a super strong green giant when he got angry, another who used a shield, another who had a hammer and controlled lightning, and another with super technological armor, there were more, but I don't remember them, that was more than a year ago the woman explained with a slight smile. Remembering that group of heroes. Izuku just listened attentively to everything Kaina told him, he had already guessed the team of heroes he had worked with, not being able to help but think that he would have liked to meet them, if only the situation were different. For several minutes, Kaina continued telling the boy about various missions she had had with that team of heroes, as well as other soldiers who occasionally went to that sector. Apparently, with all this war business, not only were the villains taking advantage to come out of the shadows, but also numerous terrorist groups had emerged to do their thing. As was the case with an old terrorist organization called Hydra, with which Kaina and said heroes had had several confrontations, managing to win several of them. The sniper's missions were mostly about eliminating various villains and rescuing as many survivors as possible. Although she and her team had also had several casualties. Until one battle, they had been overwhelmed by a large number of enemies, mostly Nomis, including several high ends. Because of that, they had to separate, that was a couple of weeks ago, and since then she had not met any of the others again. She did not know if they were alive or not, although it was most likely that they had fallen to the enemy. After that, some soldiers found me and told me that we had to evacuate, and they brought me here, I think you already know the rest the woman finished telling her story. 
Izuku was surprised by the sniper's story, although he felt sad about the end his team went through. He knew that she was already more than used to the death of others, but that did not mean that it did not affect her. He could see how in her eyes there was a small glimmer of sadness, a sadness that she hid very well under that look of seriousness and professionalism, which she managed to perfect after having done the dirty work of the Hero Association for so many years. I. I'm sorry that happened, they must have been great heroes he would say regretfully. Yes they were, some of them had a bit of an inflated ego, but they were good people, the purple-haired man responded with a bit of grace, as he remembered a certain hero in technological armor. In this way, both continued walking through that ancient temple, which now served as a refuge. The green-haired boy helped Kaina to get to know the place, locating her and showing her the most important parts, although in almost all of them there were people that the soldiers had saved from cities taken by villains. At one point, both of them would arrive at one of the training camps, which slightly caught the sniper's interest. Izuku told her that this was where soldiers were trained, and that in fact, he himself was doing the special training that the owner of the temple offered. Aina had asked about what that training was about, but the freckled man only told her that she would have to ask the owner of the temple herself. They stayed like that for an hour, until the freckled boy had to leave, because he had to continue with his training, something that the sniper understood perfectly, saying goodbye to the boy with a slight smile. As the green-haired man walked away, his expression changed to a more serious one. He couldn't help but think that he was meeting old friends and or acquaintances again, he was surrounding himself again with people he appreciated, and that was good. But. With that, images of her dead friends came back to her mind, making her remember that she had not been able to protect them, as if her own being was reproaching her for her weakness, and with that, a feeling of fear began to invade her. What if that happened again? What if they died again? She didn't think she could bear any more losses. And that's why he had to become stronger, he had to obtain more power to stop Tamura once and for all, and avoid more deaths. I needed more power. Much more power. The days passed, quickly turning into weeks. The magic training continued, only this time, Kaina was accompanying them. Izuku was glad of this, having another friend nearby. The green-haired boy had introduced the purple-haired girl to Melissa and Rodi, who were a little surprised that they already knew each other, the brown-haired boy hadn't been able to help but make a little joke about how many of Izuku's friends had been appearing lately, managing to get a little laugh out of Izuku himself. Quickly, everyone was progressing more and more, although not in the same ways, Wong had taught everyone that there were hundreds of ways to use magic, and that each one should adapt it to their own style, this would help them greatly in a fight. Each of them had decided to train on their own, so they could better develop their own combat styles with magic. Melissa was the first to achieve this, having already trained in Kamertage for quite some time, she had more experience with magic. Her style specialized in defense, using her magic to create large shields, which were capable of resisting a large amount of damage, in addition to being able to reinforce her magic shield, which she could also use to attack from a distance when casting it. You could say that the blonde had become a real tank. The next to create her own style was Kaina, who had combined her quirks rifle with her new magical abilities, managing to super enhance that weapon to astonishing levels, both in precision and attack power, in addition to improving her physical abilities by enhancing them with magic. Izuku was next, he had decided to continue with his hand-to-hand -hand combat style, only this time, instead of Ofa, he used the power of magic, managing to increase his physical abilities greatly, to the point where he rivaled the power of Ofa, and, in Wong's words, if he continued training, he could surpass him without too many problems, which made the freckled boy happy. And finally, Rodi managed to learn his own style of combat to use magic. The brown-haired boy was the one who had the hardest time, since he already had difficulties learning magic, and he was not exactly a fighter, so he had to find a way to advance. And he had succeeded. One afternoon, while he was resting and playing a little with a little pink bird that gave him his quirk, a great idea came to his mind. He decided to concentrate his magic on Pino, to see if he could make him stronger and more powerful. And boy did I succeed. The result was that he was now able to turn that small tender bird into a huge majestic phoenix made of pure magic. It was certainly an achievement of which he was extremely proud. Bong was happy with the progress those four had made, they would undoubtedly be a great team. However, there was still a long way to go, although he did not know if they would have enough time. Currently, the green-haired man was in the sanctuary's library, having several stacks of books on the table, while he had all his attention focused on the book he was reading, this in order to increase his knowledge about magic and thus become more powerful. It was already about 4.30 in the morning, and the freckled man was clearly tired and sleep-deprived due to the large dark circles under his eyes, but even so, he tried hard to stay awake and continue reading. But at that, all the boy's concentration was broken when he heard a female voice reach his ears. Wow, you sure are pretty focused on that. 
He raised his gaze slightly, meeting the owner of the voice. Upon doing so, he could recognize a brown hair which reached her shoulders and noticed a permanent blush on her cheeks. But, the strange thing was that he could not see beyond that, he could not see what her face looked like or any feature of it. However, despite this, he did not feel nervous, on the contrary, he felt happy and calm. He, what can I say? I've always been a nerd when it comes to information the boy would say, letting out a light laugh. Haha, I can see that. Although, don't you think you've tried hard enough already? I mean, you haven't slept all night, you should take a break. Izuku couldn't help but smile at these words, almost rolling his eyes. Those words, that situation, were undoubtedly familiar to him, but he couldn't remember. She knew someone else had said those words to her. Not to overexert herself, to rest. It was so. Nostalgic, and at the same time it gave her a pang in her heart to hear them. You don't have to worry, I'm fine he replied simply, returning his attention to the book. You always say that, I'm sick of hearing you repeat the same phrase over and over again, it's obvious that you're not okay demanding yourself like this is not good, you only hurt yourself. Izuku frowned at these words, feeling as if he had heard them before and for some reason, it bothered him quite a bit. I already told you, I'm fine. You don't have to worry the freckled man would say, without looking up, trying to continue reading. Please understand, you have to stop being so stubborn. I can't, I have to keep going and get stronger. Otherwise. They'll die too, I don't think so. I don't think I can bear any more losses. He would say with great regret in his voice, feeling a lump forming in his throat. I understand that you want to protect others, but this way you are only hurting yourself more. I already told you. I'm fine the freckled man exclaimed, already annoyed by that person's insistence, to the point that he raised his voice, and his words echoed through that ancient library. Due to the boy's scream, footsteps were quickly heard approaching, it being none other than Wong. Izuku, what are you doing here at this hour? It's too late to be training the Sorcerer Supreme asked upon seeing someone in the library at that hour, when everyone else was already resting. At that time, the only ones awake were the soldiers on the night shift, who were standing guard to ensure that no strangers approached the shelter. For a second, the green-haired boy blushed in embarrassment at this. However, he glanced sideways at where the person he was talking to should be, realizing that there was no one there. At all this time, he was talking to himself. Yes I'm sorry Mr. Wong, I was just. Studying a little the boy said, while letting out a yawn from sleep, while rubbing one of his eyes. Obviously, your clear lack of sleep was instantly noticed by the bald man, who frowned at this, approaching his student until he was standing in front of you. Izuku, it would be best if you went to sleep the Sorcerer Supreme would say seriously. These words only annoyed the green-haired boy, who frowned, also remembering the words of that hallucination. Mr. Wong, I can't rest, I must continue. If we don't get stronger, we will lose against Tamura, he is still out there causing chaos, for every second that passes, hundreds of lives are lost because of him. This can't continue like this. The former student Tahiro expressed himself with great regret in his voice. The man could only look sadly at his student, knowing that he still carried the weight of the deaths of all his friends and family on his back. I see. The sorcerer said seriously and sadly, staring at his student. Hey, see what? The freckled man asked confused, looking up from the book he was reading. To the crab that swims in a pool at night. Wong would say, well his look turned to one of complete seriousness, and his voice acquired a deeper tone, I wonder who is holding their breath there. I think it would be best for them to get out of that pool as quickly as possible. Izuku stood still, his gaze fixed on his master, not knowing what to say at these words, which left him thoughtful. Tiled, all magic users swim in melancholy. But, there is always a pattern, the greatest magicians have always shown varying degrees of magic, madness and sadness, the bald man explained, while using his magic to draw a sad face in the air, which quickly faded I tell you this because you have shown this same pattern, you have a great talent for the mystical arts. And yet, I'm not strong enough. I murmur helplessly. For now. Not forever. We sorcerers are not prophets Wong replied. So what are we supposed to be? The green-haired man exclaimed, already stressed and annoyed by the whole situation. At this, Wang only remained silent for a second, before letting out a small sigh. Follow me. Was the only thing he said, as he turned around and began to leave the library. Confused, Izuku put the book down on the table, before following his teacher. After a few minutes, both teacher and student arrived at a room in the deepest part of the temple, having gone down several floors by stairs. In this room, there was a kind of disc in the center, while above said disc, a large planet Earth made of rock floated majestically. All heroes protect the world from physical dangers. We sorcerers protect it from somewhat more. Mystical threats the Sorcerer Supreme explained, as he turned the disc a little, causing the figure of the Earth to glow orange and begin to spin. Boy, I am the last in a long line of Supreme Sorcerers. 
A list that began thousands of years ago with the father of the mystical arts, the mighty Agamotto, a sorcerer so powerful that he managed to create one of the most powerful magical objects, the Eye of Agamotto. Bezuku paid full attention to Wang's explanation. A long time ago, before the era of quirks, Agamotto created three magic shrines around the world, which together create a protective field around the world. The shrines protect the world, and the wizards protect the shrines. Bezuku was more than fascinated by the information Wang was telling him, although he felt like something was missing. But. Something happened, right? Letting out a small sigh, the bald man continued with his explanation. Many years ago before quirks existed, a tragic event occurred for the entire magical community. A sorcerer rebelled against the former Sorcerer Supreme. The fanatic Cassilius made a pact with a being known as Dormammu, a being of immense power from another universe, a cosmic conqueror who sought to absorb our universe into his dark dimension. Cassilius became a servant of Dormammu and betrayed the magical community, attacked the sanctuaries, putting our entire world at risk, he had managed to destroy two of the sanctuaries, causing Dormammu's dark dimension to begin to filter into ours. But, a sorcerer stood up to Dormammu, his name was. Stephen Strange Wong smiled nostalgically as he mentioned that name, before continuing with the story he was someone with great determination and a natural and extraordinary talent for the mystical arts, he used the Eye of Agamotto and stood up to Dormammu, managing to lock him in a time loop, but being trapped forever in the dark dimension with him, to this day, the time loop still remains. Keeping this world safe from Dormammu. Stephen Strange made the ultimate sacrifice to save humanity. With Dormammu trapped, we managed to defeat his servants and repair the sanctuaries, and we managed to be at peace, until something happened. To say that the green-haired man was surprised by what had been revealed was an understatement, he was completely in shock. The history of the mystic arts was simply incredible, especially the part about that man, Stephen Strange. Upon hearing the great sacrifice he had made to save the world, Izuku felt enormous respect for that man, who was undoubtedly a hero in every sense of the word. However, a great deal of intrigue and curiosity arose in the boy, feeling that whatever Wong was about to say, it would be something very big. During the battle against Cassilius, part of Dormammu's dark dimension leaked into ours, when we managed to repair the sanctuaries and expel it, we believed that there would be no consequences. It was a grave mistake. Wong let out a sigh before continuing with his explanation, the dark magic of that dimension managed to leak into ours, lodging and fusing with people who began to present certain changes. You probably already know the first one. The brilliant baby of China. W what? The green-haired man's eyes widened at these words, in disbelief at such a massive revelation. Yes. Quirks are nothing more than fragments of magic from the dark dimension, which mutated over the generations until they became the quirks so common today. Since the appearance of quirks, hundreds of theories had been launched about their origins, such as that they were a gift from God, or that they were the next step in human evolution, the latter being the most accepted. But still, number 100% correct answer was ever found. But. Right at that moment, that man had just revealed to him the truth about quirks, information that hundreds or even thousands of people had been searching for for years. But. Even with this incredible revelation, there were still doubts in Izuku's mind. W wait. There's something I don't understand he said, drawing Wang's attention, why did they never come to light? Why did the sorcerers stay hidden? Magic could have been of great help to humanity, not only to fight against villains, but for other aspects such as medicine. So, why stay hidden when this power could bring so much good? Boy, with the appearance of the quirks, the first thing that emerged were the villains, greedy and power-hungry people, willing to do anything to get it. While the quirks brought good things, they were also the main creation of monsters like All for One and Tamara, now. Imagine what kind of monsters would be born if it were revealed to the whole world that there is a power even greater than the quirks, what those people would be capable of doing to get their hands on the secrets of the mystical arts. It was a risk we were not willing to take, so we decided to remain a secret. The reason we decided to open our doors at this time was that this is the worst time humanity has ever gone through, this war involves us all. We sorcerers were forced to come out of the shadows to give our support to the people and thus end this conflict once and for all. The freckled boy was completely silent at the sorcerer's words. While he understood the reason why they remained hidden, it didn't seem entirely right to him, it even seemed somewhat hypocritical that they decided to come to light just when things were going to hell. However, he was perfectly aware that he was still very new to the whole subject of the mystic arts, there were still subjects he didn't know about, and he was still only an 18-year-old boy. He had no right to judge the actions of those people. Not to mention, he had to agree with Wong on one thing, and that was the fact that he didn't like at all to imagine what would happen if the power of magic ended up falling into the hands of someone like Tamura or Afo. That simple thought sent a chill through his body. Wong just let out a small sigh once he had completely finished telling the story, noticing how the freckled boy was still processing everything. 
I know it's a lot to process, but sometimes the truth helps us make better decisions. The man approached Izuku and gently took him by the shoulder, giving him a comforting look Izuku. I've told you this big secret because I trust you and I want you to know that you can trust others. You have to understand that this isn't just your battle. I understand that you're afraid of losing more people, but overexerting yourself at this level will not achieve anything. Without saying anything else, Wong turned around and left the room, leaving the boy alone and with many things to think about after that conversation. Let me know in the comments below if you guys want the next part. Also check out my other video that has been shown and left. Thank you for watching, if you enjoyed this video please like and share this video. And have a fantastic day bye.